Hello and welcome to a very sunny Tankfest 2023. I'm Richard Cutland, a member of the World of Tanks team, and before that I was a member of the Royal, uh, the Royal Armoured Corps and the Royal Tank Regiment. And I'm Richard Smith, I'm the director of the Tank Museum here in Bovington, uh, which holds the world's finest collection of tanks and armoured fighting vehicles. And you have made a fantastic decision about what to do with your afternoon today, where you're joining us here live from Tankfest 2023. And Tankfest is the world's best and biggest display of moving historic armour, where we bring to life the story of tanks and the people who serve with them. And don't forget, if you're watching on Twitch, make sure you stay with us long enough to receive and claim your exclusive Tankfest Twitch drops. We'll have guaranteed drops after 30 and 60 minutes of watch time, and also two mystery drops, which will be available after 90 minutes and 120 minutes. Check out the link in the chat for more info. Plus, of course, if you can also support the Tank Museum through the purchase of the Chieftain Proto, plus the bundles and the Sharp Lines Tankfest camo. So today's live stream is free to watch. Uh, we want to bring our subject and our stories to as many people around the world as we possibly can. But if you do like the content today and you want to show your support, there are all sorts of ways in which you can support us. You can support us uh, by supporting us on Patreon. You can leave tips on YouTube. You can become a YouTube member. And you can buy merch in unlimited quantities from the Tank Museum online shop. I particularly commend tank slippers. Uh, the key thing with tank slippers is they look awesome but never ever try and go up and down stairs in them. <laughs> so what's coming up there? We've got lots of incredible live tank displays. We've got a host of guest interviews with them, some incredible people and also of course we've got some exclusive content. But we're here at the Tank Museum. Uh, tank Museum is the world's oldest tank museum. We were set up uh, here in Bovington uh, way back in 1923. This year is our centenary year. But for those who don't know about the Tank Museum yet are wondering what we are, here's what you need to know. The Tank Museum, Bovington, UK. The home of the tank. The home of Tankfest and home to one of the finest collections of armour in the world. The Tank Museum tells the story of the tank and the people that served in them. There are 300 vehicles here, most of which are displayed inside the museum's large halls. In fascinating modern exhibitions, you'll come face to face with tanks that have seen action in every major conflict since the First World War. From the world's first tank to some of the latest, there is an extensive World War II collection and unique examples of the prototypes that didn't quite make the grade. With a workshop facility and an extensive archive and supporting collection, the Tank Museum is a center of armored excellence, sharing its passion with a global audience on its YouTube channel. As a not-for-profit organization, our work is funded entirely by people like you. You can support us by backing our Patreon, buying something from our online store, joining our friends scheme, or simply by making a donation using PayPal giving. So Richard, new exhibition, absolutely fantastic. Can you show us around and also tell us perhaps the thought process behind this? Love to. So the new exhibition here at the Tank Museum is called Tanks for the Memories, which is a joke that was first used in 1916. And this is about the tank as a cultural icon, because ever since tanks came to be, they've always been used in popular culture. So this is about the tank in popular culture and how people get introduced to subject sharing. Because most people, most people aren't coming to this as soldiers. Most people are coming in through some sort of cultural entry point. So we've got comics, we've got books, uh, we've got um, uh, model making, and also a lot of people think the airfix generation, how people get into this in the first place. I played with toy soldiers, I read my comics, Victor Comic, personal favourite. Tanks have always been a feature in the media. They're, they're a, a symbol of power. So we've got the Tiananmen Square sort of classic imagery here. We've got Michael, the first Sherman to be given to the British by the Americans in the Second World War. It, it was paraded all over the country as a symbol the Americans are on our side. And of course, we've got toys. Toys, that this is the classic, I had one of those. So loads of people will remember the Action Man tank, the Scorpion. This is the original artwork 
uh, from the Action Man tank box. And here's a scorpion with the box. I say I remember vividly the Christmas that I got this as a gift. Best Christmas ever. And here's what you'd have got. Yep. Here's, the, here's the Action Man scorpion itself, complete with the uh, tank commander <laughs> yeah. in his RTR yeah, barrow. Absolutely good. Which, uh, I'm sure you see as the authentic <laughs> Tank Commander. But these are all things that are imagery that people are familiar with. You've got you know, dinky toys, you've got uh, Britain's models, you've got World of, there's World of Tanks, four <laughs> games there as well. We've got uh, Action Man stuff for the kids to play with top trunks. These are how interest starts in the subject area. For me, it was Toy Soldiers, Victor Comics were the way to go. And one of the re re reasons we love working with World of Tanks is that the entry point into the subject area now, how people become interested, is often video games and you know, video games aren't a new phenomena they've been around we've got a little console here and this shows video games from the past in all of their glory which my kids would be appalled at this where if you look at this is there we go this is 1980s at its finest is an abrams <laughs> game uh, and it's if you look at the graphics on this probably wouldn't cut it in the 21st century but this was, i don't know it's pretty retro pretty popular <laughs> yeah, again it's, it's all coming around this was bleeding edge though but same about the same we have bleeding edge from the 21st century as well we've got our our new gaming zone yeah so of course with the gaming zone we had pc set up at the end there for about three years now wasn't it but of course everybody kept saying what about the other platforms so now we've got console introduced here and next to it as well is the Blitz. So we've got Willow Tanks on mobile as well. Um, and I think you'll agree, I mean, the setup looks absolutely oh, fantastic. It's terrific, isn't it? And this is our new entry point. These are modeled in our collections, and it brings it to life for a new generation. <clears throat> Richard, what a fantastic new exhibition. Very different from anything you've had done here before. What's the, what's the public reaction been yeah, it's like? It's been really positive, actually. We weren't sure how it was going down. Everything we've done before has always been a kind of really sort of pretty much straight down the line military history display. And this is the first one where we've been trying to look at a broader selection of the collections we've got and, and how people relate to this stuff. And what we've seen is people going around thinking, I remember Victor Comics and in the toy sections, I had one of those and the movies and stuff like this. People have really liked it. And actually, if you're thinking about coming to the Tank Museum, it's a display that really blends in a whole load of really interesting stuff, the whole load of stuff for the kids to play with as well. And that's worked really well. And especially we're particularly chuffed that because it's our centenary year, it's a way of celebrating that without sort of banging on about ourselves. Because the, And the foundation of the Tank Museum in itself was a little bit fuzzy. We know something happened in 1923, and what we think happened was Rudyard Kipling, the writer, visited Bovington, and he saw all these tanks laid out and declared that someone should make a museum from this lot. And what we're not sure what happened then, but my version is that a tank museum rose from the ground to the sound of heavenly <laughs> music, which is probably about right. <laughs> uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to have a look at some of the highlights from this morning's displays. The thing to remember about the First World War is nobody could anticipate the way it turned out. Everybody expected in August 1914 that it would be mobile warfare, that you would have uh, the fighting arms, cavalry, infantry, artillery, armies would move around the landscape. Where they bump into one another, that's where you have a battle. That's the way it had always been, and it was confidently expected. That's how it would work out. Mark I is the first tank to see combat, and it is on the Somme in September 1916 in the sector Flair Corselet, and about a dozen Mark Is go forward. And the enemy find this terrifying. Metal monsters crawling towards their trenches. The A7V is coming forward. Like all the tanks of this period, it's very slow. Um, British tanks are primitive. There's no two ways about that. The A7V, primitive doesn't sum it up. Dreadful does. It is a massive vehicle. They only built 20 of them. No two were identical. And this has an 18-man crew. So, ladies and gentlemen, we've seen that first tank attack. We've seen that tank being used in the First World War. What we just want to come into is that period, the 1920s and 30s. We, as we all know here, we've got that wonderful benefit of hindsight. We know what happens. We know what... Uh, what tanks ended up being like, what they were, the thickness of the armour, the guns they put on them. After the First World War, there was a really big debate in a number of countries, including Britain. Are we ever going to need or want tanks again? Um, 
in back in America. They got rid of their tank corps. They gave what tanks they had to the infantry. Similarly in France, uh, the tanks were actually distributed as uh, support weapons rather than on their own. Luckily for Britain, some of the people that had been influential in the tanks in the First World War managed to make their case. So even though there wasn't much money in Britain, we ended up investing in working out things like, if we were to mechanise our forces, what trucks would we need? And coming onto the arena is the workhorse, if you like, of the Deutsche Afrika Corps. This is the Panzer Mark III. Now, this is, I, I'm told, this is the most historically intact um, example of a Mark III which still exists. As it is virtually as it was captured in the desert. The tank they had to counter it is also entering the arena now. You've seen the Matilda I, that little heavily armoured but inadequately armed infantry tank. This is the Matilda II. A much bigger vehicle, much bigger turret, much bigger gun. It's mounting that two-pounder that you saw displayed, a 40 millimeter. And I have to say, in all honesty, the 40 millimeter, the two-pounder on this Matilda is, was superior to the bigger gun on the Panzer, on the Panzer III. Now, the Matilda had proved so dominant in the fight against Mussolini's invading Italians that she earned herself the nickname of the Queen of the Desert. The Italians had nothing that could penetrate her main armour. And the two-pounder gun there was capable of taking out any Italian tank that it faced. The standard Italian M1340s and uh, 41s were not proof against that gun. It was an excellent tank. Now, in fact, the Germans have come up against the Matilda IIs in the battle for France, in a British counterattack, rounded about Arras. These Matildas have proved to be impervious to the standard German anti-tank gun, that 37mm, which was originally fitted on the Mark III behind me. And we're coming into the arena now is the sort of thing which would have turned the blood of many 8th Army tankers into ice water. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the infamous Flak 88. It's being pulled on by its tractor of choice, SDKFZ-7, uh, designed primarily as a, as a heavy artillery tractor and also a troop carrier. It allowed the gun crews to travel in the back of the vehicle. There were also spare ammunition in there as well. But behind it, you can see that absolutely characteristic shape of the Flak 88. Designed as an anti-aircraft gun, hence flak. Now then, in 1941, America entered the war. Roosevelt was anxious to get American troops into action. He sent troops to North Africa in something called Operation Torch. An Anglo-American force landed in, in Vichy French, North Africa, and they started to advance eastwards. The British were advancing westward squeezing the Africa Corps. This is the M3A1 Stuart. All right. Now, I'm more or less contractually required to mention Churchill at least once every time I make, make one of these uh, displays. Churchill famously found it difficult to cope with the fact that you had an M3 light tank, an M3 medium tank, M4 medium tank. So he said, for goodness sake, why don't they just give them names? And we named them after American generals. This is named after the Confederate General Jeb Stuart. Uh, we also had the Grant, which was the first tank we had in North Africa capable of firing high explosive. The vehicle coming on next, you can see here, bashing on the arena, an impressive turn of speed. This is the T-16 Universal Carrier, and this is also an American-built vehicle. Although it is almost a quintessentially English design, we associate the Universal Carrier. When I was growing up, it was always referred to as the Bren Gun Carrier. This, in fact, is the T-16 made by the Americans. Ford of America were making Universal Carriers for the British. They couldn't keep up with the demand. We asked the Americans to build them, and Ford of America, the parent company, in, based in Massachusetts, made these in large numbers 
mostly used by the Canadians, I have to say. Some of them were, were used by the British. Um, almost entirely, in this instance, this particular version, uh, for use as an artillery um, tractor. And you can see pulling behind it, this is the six-pounder. Now, we've got one more tank coming on the arena. And this is my second mention of Churchill. Although I could have mentioned that the uh, honey there is named after his wife, Clementine. Um, this is the Churchill Mark III, an infantry tank, a replacement, if you like, for Matilda. Still got that thinking that we need a heavily armoured tank which can deal with machine guns in particular and which can lead the infantry across heavy broken ground. If you look at this Mark III Churchill, you'll see the link with the First World War. It's got that kind of look about it. It's because the tracks come over the top of the hull. It's got that kind of First World War look about it. Originally, the Churchill was not desperately reliable. Um, allegedly, Winston Churchill, when shown one of the prototypes, said, it's big, it's ugly, it's unreliable. Obviously, you named it after me. Latterly, it became a very, very effective tank. By the time we get to the Mark III, we've got a vehicle here which is capable of dealing with the desert conditions relatively well. And remember, you have to desertify, if you will, your vehicles. They've got to have the filters to deal with the sand and the heat and everything else. It's been a fantastic morning here at the Tank Museum at Tank Fest 2023. Some of the rounds going off there from the uh, anti-tank guns, when in real life, they make the windows rattle. It's been quite impressive. Richard, what have been your highlights of the morning? Do you know, I love to see the, the, the World War One armour as well. I mean, especially when you've got your replica A7V, the way it, it trundles along there and rocks a bit. But I know you're a World War One armour enthusiast World yourself. World War, everything after 1918, bit of a detail, to be honest. The First World War was what brought me into this game in the first place. It's the area I've always had a passion for. And the, uh, it's fantastic to be able to have the, the War Horse replica tank as well, the A7V, with the only people who can can do both of those and it's that first world war stuff the beginning of armored warfare where it all starts and of course the, the history that, of my regiment you know the, the, the formation absolutely. of the machine gun corps yeah they and the red the royal tank regiment badge remains a first world war tank the uh, that rhomboid tank there's something evocative about that that never happens though since my my most fond memory of the tank museum has been taking a ride in the back of the last working first world wow. war tank it was a, a most extraordinary experience but we're going to go back to what's been going on here at Tank Fest now, and it's great to walk around Tank Fest and bump into old friends. And I bumped into a, a great friend. The, the, the Ukrainians on, uh, have come to the day as well. Uh, bumped, bumped into a, a wonderful old friend who I've known for a long time, uh, just the other day, and I had, a, I had a bit of a chat and a catch up, and we're going to cut over to that now. One of the great joys of Tank Fest is I get to catch up with people from all over the world. And in particular, I was looking forward to meeting Victor Kisley uh, from Wargaming, where we get to meet each other roughly once a year. <laughs> once a year. And actually have a good old chat and find out what's going on in the world. And we've, we've been meeting up for 14, 12, 15, uh, 12, uh, 12 years. 12, 12 years, exactly. Yeah. The, uh, and it's, it's always a Victor, lovely to see you here and, and taking the time to have a chat. Likewise. So, um, when we first met, the thing that united us was our common love of military history. How, how, did, how did you, what, what turned you into a military history enthusiast? It's very, very simple. Uh, books, movies, documentaries, and postage stamps. Postage stamps? Postage stamps. <laughs> you can't go wrong with the great stuff. And what was it that got you into tanks in particular? I think, uh, well, World War II was, uh, in many respects, about tanks, right? Yeah. And. <clears throat> There is something. <clears throat> there is something to tanks, uh, which all boys love. They just, they're cool. Uh, they're just cool. They're <laughs> big. They're powerful. They have big guns. They shoot. They they roar and they they're, they're heavy. They're very well protected. They can smash things. Uh, there's so many fantasies about there, there's tanks. An, there's an awesomeness. There's this tanks. awesomeness and the sound when it moves. <laughs> Excellent. So. 
within tank side, if you could take any tank from history, either that exists now or doesn't exist anymore, and get something running and return it into good order, what, what would you pick? Uh, uh, Panther, the German tank. Panther. What, why Panther? There was a couple of them running in the world. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> One of them I saw personally in Littlefield collection <clears throat> in, in, in California. It just, uh, it's such a, an amazing piece of German engineering. It's perfectly made. It's not rough on the edges. It's, it's, uh, it's, it, it, it's like just a masterpiece. Good. It's a masterpiece. <laughs> so it looks like, uh, yeah, it, it was a good fighting machine. It was a good fighting machine. Very expensive, very expensive. As you mentioned once to me, there were, no, there were no two Panthers which are the same. <clears throat> so Absolutely. they were literally like those Ferraris or Maseratis <laughs> finished by hands and uh, unique. There's something about handmade stuff that looks great, but is expensive and totally impractical. But the Germans love that. Actually, the British love that stuff as well, <laughs> which, is, which is one of the reasons that yeah, we, won't, we won't go into British tanks. British tanks have their moments. So if, yeah, you're, at tank, you're a regular at Tank Fest and have been for a long time. If you were going to explain Tankfest to someone who'd never been here before, how would you explain Tankfest? Well, it's a, it's a very nice part of <clears throat> England, Dorset, right? Uh, three days of, how many this year? 25,000 uh, people, families, fathers, mothers, <clears throat> brothers, sisters, lots of kids. A uh, huge area, pretty much devoted to tanks. Of course, there are some hot dogs, there's uh, hamburgers, there's beer, there's uh, like some gift shop. Gift shop is amazing. Gift shop it's is awesome, very, it? <coughs> very amazing. That's the best museum in the world. Let's put it like uh, this. I have been in museums uh, around the world, starting from Greek pottery and stuff, <laughs> uh, La Louvre, etc. <coughs> Other specialized museums, but this one is by far the best museum in the world. Museum of any type. I can only agree. What can I say? So, and we've worked together for a long time. Um, uh, yeah, Wargaming's been involved with the Tank Museum at least 12 years. Uh, the, uh, and yeah, what, what does working with the Tank Museum, what does the association with the Tank Museum mean for you and for Wargaming? I think this is uh, very obvious. We made this game <clears throat> 12 years ago called World of Tanks, which is a computer simulation, uh, you know, of tank battles of World War II, right? And here, you have probably the biggest collection of tanks like anywhere in the world and people, tank fest specifically, people come here to, to look at tanks, to see them running around, to touch them, to have the tour of the museum, again, which is the best museum in the world. Uh, our players are coming here, usually we have our player meetings, we have our streams, we have our, our influencers, our best players coming and streaming and <laughs> giving uh, you know, autographs. <clears throat> And, uh, but that's, the, the, that's both ways. A lot of your visitors who never knew about World of Tanks before naturally became um, players and we brought additional couple of... You know, what, what, what was your attendance um, uh, 12 years ago? Bef you, before you guys were involved, we were on about eight to 10,000 visitors. Now we're on 24,000. Yeah, so we, we may safely attribute at least 10, 15,000 uh, extra visitors to the fact that World of Tanks, uh, you know, heavily advertises and promotes these two, three days uh, to come here. It's really far away, like from anywhere <laughs> in the world. It's a secret place it. in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> yeah, and almost 30,000 people somehow get here, uh, like uh, just to, to, be, to be in this uh, amazing place during this amazing event. Fantastic. Victor, it's always a joy to see you. Uh, thank you so much for your support over many years, both for the museum and for me. Uh, thank you for bringing us to new audiences and helping keep these alive. For new generations. Now, now, we're, now we're doing a lot of online stuff, right? But one last thing. The best, the best thing about this museum is personal tour of the museum by Richard Smith. <laughs> I, was, I was lucky in my life to have at least five good tours alone with my family, with my friends, and this is never, this is never the same. It's unforgettable experience when this gentleman, when you <laughs> make this tour uh, is like you you cannot not love tanks after this tour <laughs> it's a pleasure thank you lovely to see you thank again you. this is a 75 millimeter gun but what does that actually mean and why is it called that 
75 millimeters is the caliber of this gun, and caliber is the internal measurement of the diameter of the barrel. You could also say that it's the size of the hole at the end of the gun. Simple enough. However, if we go over here to this Sherman Firefly, it uses a gun called a 17 pounder. So what does that mean? 17 pounds is the weight of the projectile that's fired out of this gun. And whilst it's referred to as a 17 pounder gun, it does still have a caliber, which in this case is 76.2 millimeters. Now that might all sound a bit confusing, and you're also probably wondering, why aren't all guns just measured in millimeters? And that is a very good question. Traditionally, the British Army and Navy named their large guns like this, and this method of measurement continued into World War II. However, other countries such as the United States, Germany, and even the Soviet Union typically named their tank guns after their caliber, given in millimeters, centimeters, or even inches. And during World War II, the British began to do this with some of their guns as well. It wasn't until shortly after World War II, around the same time that NATO was established, that most countries moved to a standardized way of measuring a gun's caliber, and ultimately, that was in millimeters. Armor-piercing rounds, they do exactly what they say on the tin. However, throughout history, armor-piercing ammunition has gone from big chunks of metal to hypersonic darts, capable of not only piercing through a tank, but igniting the environment within. During World War I, tank-on-tank -tank engagement was extremely rare due to the fact that the tank was a fairly new invention. But after the war, it became obvious that if another conflict was going to arise, tanks would have to fight other tanks. This ultimately led to weapons such as the QF-2 Pounder being developed, a gun commonly used on tanks like the Valentine and the Matilda II. This is where the solid shot armor piercing round came into play. It's as simple as it gets a lump of steel designed to punch a hole through enemy armor. But as time went on, armor improved, meaning this solid shot round was far less effective, and this forced development of new types of ammunition. One of the rounds that was developed was the armor-piercing discarding Sabo, also known as APDS, and it's made up of two main components. The projectile itself and the Sabo which surrounds it. The Sabo is just there to ensure that the projectile is dead center of the barrel, and when it's fired, the Sabo falls off, leaving the smaller projectile hurtling towards its target. Due to the projectile itself being smaller than earlier rounds, this type of round has greater kinetic energy and could achieve much higher velocities than its predecessors. APDS started seeing use in 1944, and it was found that they could make very short work of the heavily armored German tanks like the Tiger and Panther. But it doesn't stop there. Eventually, APDS would evolve into this, APFSDS, armor-piercing, fin-stabilized, discarding Sabo. Essentially, a hypersonic dart capable of achieving velocities well over a mile per second. They're also made of extremely dense materials like tungsten and even depleted uranium. Fin rounds have been used for decades by forces all around the world and they still see use today. You might think it's impossible to stop one of these hypersonic rounds from tearing a hole straight through a heavily armored tank. But as ammunition got more advanced, so did armor. But that is a topic for another video. Welcome back to Tank Fest 2023, live here at the Tank Museum. Uh, fan the Tank Man, Richard. Big fan. He's been doing it, I think, for about a year now. Yeah. Um, TikTok, of course. Super. Absolutely superb videos, very educational and also entertaining at the same time. They are, and, so, and uh, Paul, who does that, has been fantastic. Yeah, we, we've been going just over a year. We had, we had about 70 million views of our TikTok wow. content in the first year. And the important thing to remember for this is this isn't just a normal TikTok channel. We're a museum. We're here to try and bring this collection to life and not just bring it to life for people who are already enthusiasts, but for people who are being introduced to the subject. And what we found with TikTok, it's taken us to a whole new audience of particularly teenagers. Um, and people are just getting their, the appetite whetted of, wow, this is actually really interesting. The thing that gave me the most satisfaction is some of our first videos to go over a million views on TikTok uh, were about First World War tanks. Now, I'm not going to bang on about First World War tanks, <laughs> but Much. it's great that actually it was not just the kind of Second World War drill and stuff. It's actually the whole range of material that people are getting really into and bringing the subject to alive to new generations is fantastic. It is. And a big shout out, of course, for if you don't follow Fan the Tank Man, please do follow his TikTok channel. Um, now, Richard, of course, 
Running Tanks Live, critical to your museum. Um, let's face it, without the live displays, the Tank Fest just wouldn't be Tank Fest. Yeah, absolutely. The, um, one of the things we always say here is that the Tank Museum is, we're a museum of machinery. We're telling the story of the tanks and the people who serve of them. And when you're telling the story of machinery, it's really important to bear in mind that these are not statues. So these aren't designed to be seen just yeah, static inside a building. I always describe a tank that's static inside a building. It's a bit like seeing a stuffed lion in a natural history <laughs> museum. You know, what have the kids learnt? And you might have shown them the shape of a lion. But it's, it's when you can hear it roar, it's when you can feel the ground shake, as it chases you down before it eats you. Yeah, because there is nothing like a tank, you know, driving by the, the smells, the sounds, a, uh, the it's oil. <laughs> it's technically known as a multi-sensory experience. Thank you, Richard. The, uh, the, yeah, the ground shakes, the, you can hear it. It's, it's a, the sound, especially when you get multiple tanks going around at the same time, the sound is in, incredible. Um, and it's the smell, and it's, it's a different world. You get to learn why these things are such imposing objects. Uh, you get to realise why, yeah, if tanks are coming across the battlefield, for instance, in the First World War, um, yeah, the guys looking at the tank coming the other way are thinking, oh, crumbs, yeah, this is, <laughs> this is going to be a long day. This, uh, so operating vehicles is at the heart of what we do. It's not easy, though. It's not a straightforward process at all to keep these things going. I was going to say, I mean, on those lines, a shout-out for the workshop staff that you've got here. I mean, they are what an incredible bunch. And I've you know, had the honour and privilege to you know, be shown the workshops, to get involved in some of the work they do there. Um, a great team. But, of course, having such a variety and a multitude of different vehicles, all very well for us in, in the Army. I mean, we had a, you know, one vehicle to look after. We had all the spares on tap. It must be an, a complete different thing for you. Yeah, it's, a, it's an incredible engineering challenge we've got 30 or 40 different sorts of vehicles that we're running um, therefore if you think about that these are 30 or 40 different sets of machines to understand it's spares to maintain it's problems to diagnose it's 30 or 40 different starting techniques it's, and the the skills to work these vehicles for an extended period of time are just as important to conserve as the fabric of the vehicle itself. Keeping skills alive in this field is a real challenge and the, the, the technology that we're dealing with isn't technology that the kids who are training in college today are automatically being introduced to. So we're looking at as an organisation a long horizon nowadays. We, um, we have a plan about how we maintain our vehicles in running order for the Second World War Centenary so we're looking over 20 years out, wow. thinking that actually it's really important for that next generation coming through that these vehicles are available to them. And, and the challenges are huge. And when you talk about, I mean, the... The vehicles itself, I mean, the big hitter, of course, I mean, let's mention Tiger 131 while we're here. Unfortunately, not around at Tank Fest, but coming, of course, in Tiger Day. Quick plug for Tiger Absolutely. Day. Absolutely, Tiger Day, <laughs> September. It's available online. Uh, the concerns from yourself, I mean, about the, you know, running Tiger 131, I guess. Yeah, when we're looking at these historic vehicles and how we go about running, one of the things we're considering is you know, how many different sorts of vehicles can we sustain? Which technologies can we sustain? And for each vehicle in isolation, it's the question of have we got a duplicate? So can we afford to break it? If, you, if you're running a vehicle, the one thing you guarantee, everyone knows from their own car, if you run a vehicle, you're going to break it. And the issue is, can we afford to break this vehicle and how can we afford to break it? So we've been really vigorous over the last few years at collecting duplicates and sometimes triplicates of vehicles that we can run multiple examples for so we can keep the, 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 the best one in reserve and not run it. So it's, it's a reference object. And we're taking a long time at the moment looking at some vehicles which are unique, which are maintaining and running order. So vehicles like we've got a beautiful, beautiful Silver Ghost Rolls Royce armoured car, absolutely gorgeous, but it's the only only runner uh, in the United Kingdom, uh, and there's only three in the world altogether. Uh, our Panzer III is incredibly original. Um, it's really a timepiece. It's, it's actually we are servicing a vehicle that's still got its original German Second World War assembly. And you're absolutely right. Tiger 131 is that kind of hero object <laughs> of the collection. It's the most famous tank anywhere in the world. Um, it's an Im it, it was an immensely complex vehicle to operate for guys in the 1940s who'd trained on it, who had all the spares available and had the, the designers available on call of how do you fix this? So maintaining these vehicles in running order is a, is a really serious challenge. 
And as far as the event's concerned, I mean, you can see here, I mean, it's been another blistering few days. I have to say, I don't know what it is about Tank Fest, but it brings out the best of the weather, that's for sure. It's always sunny in Dorset. Uh, they, they we're here in the south of England. So Dorset is a huge tourism area, and it's a great draw. And, and the, the audience today, when we're arranging things like Tiger Day and Tank Fest, uh, these are for audiences that are going to really appreciate this unique set of running vehicles. Tank Fest is the world's biggest display and the best display of running historic armour. But the stuff that people are seeing today this isn't just kind of run of the mill it came out the back of the shed uh, this is the stuff that's rare that's unusual this is the stuff that for a discerning audience they can see wow i've never seen one of those run today and this is a it's a fantastic show uh, the uh, i believe tickets are on sale sale for next year already uh, the, <laughs> good uh, plug, and, good uh, plug. it's a beautiful area to come and stay so the, the area is fantastic the show is unique there isn't anything like this anywhere else in the world the uh, and uh, really do thoroughly commend it to everyone now we're uh, we're heading into our next segment at the moment the uh, as i said that we would try and bring these collections to life and we do that by operating them and the best way to operate them we found is you try and put them in a context that makes them make sense we're going to go into our first live segment of world war ii armor and the commentator for this we're going to cut over to him is our very own tim broad an automatic 20 millimeter cannon it's got a rate of fire of well over a couple hundred rounds a minute so in effect it's a really really big machine gun designed to deal with light armor following it up we have a hetzer a Panzer 38T Hetzer, based on a Czech design, made by Skoda in what was then Czechoslovakia, and appropriated by the Germans when the Nazis seized the whole of Czechoslovakia in 1938. Now the Hetzer is a good example of what's known as a Panzerjäger, a hunting tank, where you take a big gun, or as big a gun as you can manage, and you mount it in a low-slung, armoured body, simply made, there's no turret, there's no turret hydraulics to worry about, worry about, but it does present a very successful ambush weapon. The Hetz is at its best when it's waiting for its enemy to come to it, backed into a coppice, even backed into a house so he can get a couple of rounds away before the, uh, the Allies know he's there. That's a 75mm gun there, you can see. Following up from the Hetzer, we have an SD KFZ 251, better known as the Hanamag. Now, those guys in the back of there are Panzer Grenadiers. During World War II, most German soldiers went to war on their own two feet, and they were resupplied with ammunition and food by horse drawn wagons. There were never enough half-track vehicles like this to either carry troops or logistics. Those that there were tended to be given either to the Waffen-SS or to Panzergrenadier units of the major um, armoured units. So these guys are Panzergrenadiers, in all probability, which means that they are tough. They're not going to give up easily. This is no pushover for any following Allied forces. After that, we've got an Opel lorry pulling a Pac-38 a 50 millimeter anti-tank gun. Now we've learned a lot today about anti-tank guns and a little bit about the sort of tactics where they were, they were used, they, how they were deployed. The Hetzer has a big 75 and that is an ambush weapon. The pack is a 50 millimeter, uh, absolutely superb at the beginning of World War II. By 1945, it's outgunned. I'm sure we made one or two of you jump earlier on when we fired the 6-pounder, which is a 57mm, and certainly when we fired, fired the 17-pounder, yeah, which uh, really outranges and outguns that pack. But the idea is that this unit here, they've been fighting a withdrawal, they're exhausted, they need to find somewhere safe to lager up for the night. And they need to cover that lager with the anti-tank gun. They're going to need that in position to protect the rest of their vehicles. Now every one of those guys there has got one eye cocked at the sky. By this stage in the war, the Allies had total air superiority. The one thing that each one of those guys in that unit is worried about are Allied 
fighter bombers, Jaeger bombers, JBOs as they called them, right? British typhoons, American thunderbolts, lightnings. Each one of them with wings full of three inch rockets, quite capable of taking out even the heaviest German armor. Some of you will have seen a Yak Tiger in the museum, which in essence is an enormous version of our Hetzer we've got out here. That Yak Tiger was abandoned by its crew when it was damaged, disabled, because they knew that if Allied fighter bombers found it, that was it, that was the end of it. As someone said to me the other day, they may just as well have scrubbed out that big black cross on the side and painted a bullseye. They were really a very, very big target. Now you can see, our gunners here are setting up the Pack 38. They're going to try and dominate the approach to the potential lager of the column. Now, obviously you can see them because we're in an arena. In reality, they would have been dug in as best they could. They'd have made good use of the terrain around them. Any bushes and what have you would have been used. They would have cut greenery down to, obviously not in January and February, but they would have cut bushes back to obscure the gun. And they are going to sit and wait there just in case there's any allied forces probing after them. They won't know. They don't have the uh, luxury of air power. They haven't got spotter planes in the air. They don't know what's going on. They're having to wait and see what comes out of the gathering dusk. And the allies are taking it very carefully. They know that they've got plenty of material. They've got the men, they have got the material, but they're reluctant to lose those men. They need decent reconnaissance. And coming onto the arena is arguably the best reconnaissance vehicle of the entire war. This is the Dame Ladingo. Specifically designed as a reconnaissance vehicle. It's, it's generally armed with a .303 rent gun, but only really for point defense. It's not a fighting vehicle. You can see the great big antenna there on it. That's its main weapon. That's what it uses to send intelligence back to its force commander. Now it's been backed up by its big brother, the Daimler Armoured Car. Very, very similar in many respects. Same kind of chassis system, neither has a, well, neither has a chassis. They're both monocoque uh, construction, which allows them better cross-country capability. Both of them sport a rather splendid five-speed pre-selected gearbox with a transverse lever. That means in effect, if you whack that transverse lever over you have got five reverse gears the Daimler Dingo is capable of 55 miles an hour forwards it can also do 55 miles an hour backwards and if you bump into a German Jagdpanzer you don't want to be doing three-point turns whack that transverse lever over and get out of there as quickly as you can the Daimler armor cars mounting a two-pounder now we know about the two-pounder it was an ex ah my goodness it's coming to fight they've missed right Luckily, the pack has missed. It's really very difficult to get an accurate line on a target moving across your front. And I'm afraid the Germans may be a little twitchy. They've gone a bit too soon and they missed. What they've done is give their position away. That Dame Ladingo now is radioing back to the Allies, saying, right, we've come under fire. There's an anti-tank gun dug in. We need to deal with it. The Daimler armored car has also withdrawn. And here comes the 222 coming to cover the pack as it redeploys, as it relocates. Now, that pack gun is of vital importance to this unit. It's the only thing they've got which is capable of taking on anything like a medium tank. So it's important that it's covered. The armored car, the 222 sweeping the area looking for some kind of allied response and here it comes the allies are still probing but this time they've come in a little more little more clout behind it we've got an m8 greyhound here the 222 is firing on it but we've got an m8 greyhound mounting oddly enough 
That 37 millimeter gun, if you remember from David's talk this morning, that 37 millimeter gun that the Americans bought from the Germans, that the Russians bought from the Germans, that's mounted on the Greyhound. And backing up the Greyhound is the M24 Chaffee. And very sensibly, the 222 is backing up a little bit. It's not like the look of this at all. The Chaffee is brand spanking new. It only came into service for the Battle of the Bulge. Only two of them took part in the Battle of the Bulge. It's a light tank designed to replace that M3 Stuart we saw this morning. And it's just open fire. Look at, whoa, it's missed, but it was a good shot. That gun on there is a 75 millimeter, originally designed to mount underneath a B-25 Mitchell bomber to, be, to use it as a tank buster. Now that never happened, but the gun was redeployed in this new light tank that the Americans are putting together. It's very quick. The problem is it's lightly armored. So if that Chaffee comes up against the Hetzer, it's got a problem. There is this formula you always have to bear in mind between mobility, firepower, and protection. You can't have everything. To get firepower and mobility, the Chaffee has sacrificed protection to some extent. And with the M8, that 37 millimeter originally intended as a tank destroyer is now a bit obsolete. And the M8 does have a problem, not so much with this kind of engagement, but it was prone to uh, mines. We haven't said much about mines today, but it was very much prone to damage from mines, so much so that the crew would often pack the base of the thing with sandbags to try and give them some protection. Now the Hetzer is coming forward. The Pac-38 has redeployed. Hetzer's coming forward, backed up by the Hanamag. In there, we've got our Panzer Grenadiers. Now, it's essential that we get infantry onto the ground to support the armor. Infantry doesn't do too well without armor. Armor doesn't do too well without infantry. It's a symbiosis. They support each other. The Panzer Grenadiers are going to be looking out for anybody threatening the Hetzer with shoulder-launched anti-tank missiles. But at the moment, they're jockeying for position. The Greyhound is manoeuvring to make sure he's got his gun pointed towards the threat. So far, the Hetzer has the edge. The problem it has is it has no turret. Its weak point is dealing with tanks which have got turrets. A tank with a turret can manoeuvre both the hull and the turret to give you plenty of flexibility to where you're pointing your gun. The Hetzer has to point the entire vehicle at it. There we go, That's, he's gone around in on the chaffee by the look of it. The Panzer Grenadiers are deploying. These guys are not going to give up without a fight. But luckily, we've got some heavier armour coming in. This is the M4 Sherman. It's a late pattern Sherman, much adapted. It's got the longer 76 millimeter gun, which is roughly equivalent to the British 17 pounder. Not quite as good, I'm bound to say. And it looks as if the Panzer Grenadiers have decided in the face of that threat to move out. If they're gonna move on, that Sherman is closing. Now, there's nothing on this battlefield that the Sherman can't cope with. The Hetzer can damage the Sherman if it gets a decent shot in. If any of those Panzer Grenadiers have got Panzer Faust or Panzer Schreck anti-tank missiles, then that can also damage the Sherman. So you'll notice now that the Allied unit is deploying its infantry. Two sections. <clears throat> They're flanking the battlefield. Now we've got a jeep coming in, completely unarmoured. This looks as if they've got... Now, uh, hang on, there's something going on here. This isn't just a reconnaissance vehicle. No, nope. let's have a look. I didn't think so, ladies and gentlemen. It's a bazooka team. The jeep, using its mobility here, has brought in a bazooka team. 
GIs are laying down some covering fire. It's all together. The Panzer Grenadiers replying. All right, you'll notice the GIs on the high ground now trying to dominate the battlefield. Keep those Panzer Grenadier heads down. There goes the bazooka. As he hit. Yes, he's hit. He's got him. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, we've somewhat shrunk the size of the battlefield. So it would have taken about that time for the bazooka shell to get there. Now that 222 will have been at least severely damaged by a bazooka. A hollow charge anti-tank weapon is perfectly capable of taking it out. Now, we've got what is shaping up to be a little bit of a battle of attrition. We've got American infantry engaging. We've got the Panzer Grenadiers engaging. We've got a mortar being brought into play now. If there's anyone left alive in that 222, the 222 has an open turret. The mortar shrapnel will pose a threat to anybody left alive in there. Smoke obscuring the battlefield. This is far from a pushover. This isn't this isn't a gentle walk into Germany. The GIs are having to fight the way. There is a Thompson submachine gun going there. Interestingly, the Tommy gun originally called the Trench Clearer, designed right at the end of World War One. This is a desperate firefight now, ladies and gentlemen. Grenadiers have automatic weapons, MP40. And I can see one of the GIs has got a BAR Browning automatic rifle. He's going to bring into play at some point, I would think. Now, more Allied armor entering the field. An M18 Hellcat. This is a tank destroyer. Not a tank as such. But again, a heavy anti-tank gun. It's the same 76mm as is mounted on our Sherman, but mounted in a light, open-topped chassis. Very, very fast. Capable of up to 50 miles an hour on the road. An American doctrine was that your tank was an exploitation weapon. If you came up against heavy enemy armor, you whistled up a tank destroyer to deal with it. Not a particularly successful doctrine because there were never enough tank destroyers. But we're lucky here, we've got a Hellcat in position. The GIs are pushing forward despite the fierce resistance. Here comes the Sherman. The Hanamag's been knocked out. There he goes, one down. Remember, by this stage of the game, the Germans aren't exactly counting every round they're firing, but the Allies have access to far more ammunition. They've abandoned the pack gun, so there's no longer any threat to the Sherman. And it looks like, yes, it looks as if Hetz has been hit. And I suspect, ladies and gentlemen, it's pretty much all over. The heavy armour advancing is to dominate the scene. I can see at least one prisoner down there amongst the Panzer Grenadiers. The GIs have taken casualties. The Germans have certainly taken casualties. This is a difficult time. Many of these Panzer Grenadiers will be ardent Nazis. You could never be entirely sure that the wounded man with one hand in the, in the air surrendering hadn't got a stick grenade behind his back. So 
it was a difficult time both to take prisoners but also to try and surrender. It was, a, it was an edgy time. Nobody wants to die this late into a war. No one's going to take risks if they think that the enemy might be shamming a surrender. But it looks as if it's all pretty clear. The Panzer Grenadiers, those who've survived, are surrendering. And the GIs are one step closer to Germany proper. Hitler's on the point of ordering all the bridges across the Rhine to be blown. He's putting his faith, his somewhat misguided faith, in Festung Deutschland, Fortress Germany. He doesn't know at the moment we don't know, the Allies don't know, that the Ludendorff Bridge across the Rhine hasn't successfully blown. The famous bridge at Remagen. And before long, Allied troops and tanks will be crossing into the Reich. And eventually, the war will come to an end. Now you can see the logistics of the thing here at the moment. Our GIs are being picked up by the GMC Deuce and a Half, one of the most prolific American military vehicles of World War II, second only to the Jeep um, in the numbers produced. Wasn't that absolutely fantastic? Uh, once again, uh, we know who the winners were. Um, and a big shout out at this, case, at this stage for the reenactors. I mean, it's a really hot day, so kudos to, for them for running around in this. Yeah, it's a great show. It's a great way of bringing the subject to life. Germans came second again. Uh, we, we do take the approach here at the Tank Museum. If the Germans want to win, they can organise their own tank fest. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we'll do it our way. Uh, I hope you're enjoying watching Tank Fest uh, here live uh, in 2023 at Tank Museum in Bovington in the south coast of England. Uh, as I said earlier, we take delight in bringing our subject uh, to as many people as we possibly can, and the live stream is free. But if you do want to support the Tank Museum, you can support us in all sorts of ways. You can uh, help us through Patreon, uh, you can leave a tip on YouTube, you can become a member on YouTube, you can buy stuff from the Tank Museum's online shop. I've already pugged the slippers. There's a whole range of stuff. If you want to leave your wish lists on there, if your family don't know what to get for you, do a wish list on the Tank Museum shop and everything they spend will support the work they do here. If you want to create a, uh, an account on World of Tanks, if you're not a World of Tanks player already, uh, do create a tank. Use the code ALPACA. And for every code with ALPACA, uh, World of Tanks actually donate to the Tank Museum as well. And it's an absolute privilege, of course, to be able to work with this incredible charity, the Tank Museum. Um, we're also this year working with another charity, a veterans charity, which is Veterans with Dogs. And to tell you a bit more about it, here's Ikibu. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Tankfest 2023 with World of Tanks and the Tank Museum. This year, we have a lot going on. So in this video, I'm going to summarize a few of the most important points, starting with this beautiful specimen, the FP4201 Chieftain P6, a tank that is very near and dear to the heart of our very own Richard Cutland and is based at the Tank Museum in Bobbington. We have some special sales going on during Tankfest 2023. Should you purchase the Chieftain Proto or the Tankfest inscription offers or even the Sharp Line style in Europe, we will donate part of the proceeds to the Tank Museum. We've worked very closely with the Tank Museum to create a style in line with the museum's brand identity, the Tankfest identity, and most important, something cool to celebrate Tankfest 2023. The museum's workshop team and the World of Tanks development team have worked together to ensure the in-game real-life tank looks as close as possible to the real-life tank. We hope that the proceeds from the sales I mentioned before will help the Tank Museum with their efforts to conserve these parts of history and keep their tanks running. And last but not least, we teamed up with Veterans with Dogs this year to create a special 2D style, emblem and decal with the one and only Ferris. These cosmetics symbolise our special bond and our commitment to raising awareness for this good cause. 
And if you purchase any of these cosmetics in Europe, then we will also have part of the proceeds go towards a charity who support former British Armed Forces members with mental health support with the aid of assistance dogs. I hope to see you at Tankfest 2023 this year. If not, tune into the stream and enjoy the show. And thank you for helping us raise awareness and do some good. I'm going to ask you all a question. Why do some tanks have sloped armor? Well, I'm guessing you said something along the lines of it causes incoming tank rounds to bounce off. And whilst this is true, it's more of a side effect of the actual reason sloped armor was implemented. One of the first tanks to effectively implement sloped armor was the Soviet T-34, a tank that had lasting influence over later tank design. The frontal armor thickness of this tank is about 47 millimeters, which really isn't much. However, due to the fact that the armor is sloped at roughly 60 degrees, it means that provided this tank is shot directly from the front, the armor effectiveness can be closer to 90 millimeters. This means the armor effectiveness has been increased while also preventing additional weight being added to the tank. There's a lot of discussion as to whether or not the Soviet T-34 was a good tank or not, but one thing that can definitely be agreed upon is that it heavily influenced future tank design, especially with vehicles like the German Panther. Were British World War II tanks really that awful? This is a question that is commonly asked amongst tank enthusiasts. And to find that answer, we need to have a look at Britain after World War I. In the 20s, Britain led the way in tank development. Due to the fact that the British had just invented the tank and were exploring new designs and methods on how to use them. Britain was also very interested in selling their hardware to other countries. Tanks like the Vickers 6 ton were exported around the world and even influenced future tank designs in some countries. Tanks like the Soviet T-26 and the Japanese Type 95 Hargo had designs that were heavily influenced by the Vickers 6 ton. However, when the Great Depression hit, Britain lost the lead in tank development. Britain was one of many countries who didn't quite know where to go in terms of tank development. So in the end, Britain had two main types of tank. The first were infantry tanks, slow, heavily armoured vehicles designed to support infantry on the battlefield, much like the heavy British tanks of the First World War. The second type were cruiser tanks, designed to essentially replace the cavalry with fast tanks that could quickly break through enemy lines. There were other types of armoured fighting vehicles developed too, but ultimately the designs were too specialised and unless they were used in very specific circumstances, they weren't going to be very effective. This was highlighted in the event that led to the evacuation at Dunkirk in 1940, where Britain lost almost all of its tanks. There are also other factors which need to be considered when talking about British tank development during the lead up to World War II. Britain had been accustomed to frame and rivet construction, and it seemed logical at the time to continue using that method. However, when a tank made in this way is hit by a tank shell, it can cause the rivets to shear off and fly off at high speeds, both inside and outside the tank, which can be fatal to the crew and any nearby infantry. But some British tanks performed better than others, such as the Matilda II, which demonstrated fantastic protection with its heavy armor when used in France and in North Africa. But it takes more than just thick armor and a good gun for a tank to be effective. One of the main issues with British tanks was their reliability, and this was typically linked to the engines that they were using. Tanks like the Crusader were initially plagued with reliability issues, and the same went for the early Churchill tanks. With reliability being one of the main issues with British tanks, the question was finally asked. Just what was the most reliable engine currently serving the British forces? The answer was the Rolls-Royce Merlin, an aircraft engine that was powering flying icons like the Spitfire, Hurricane, Lancaster, and Mosquito. A modified version of the engine was developed, designed specifically to work as a tank engine, the Rolls-Royce Meteor. Going forward, British tank quality would drastically increase. The Meteor engine first saw service with the new British Cromwell tanks in 1944, a new cruiser tank with an emphasis on reliability and mobility. The following year, the British Centurion was trialed, which also used the Meteor engine. However, instead of continuing with having different tanks for different roles, the Centurion was a universal tank, a tank which could perform multiple roles. The Centurion also featured a powerful 17-pounder gun which could make short work of heavy German tanks, and it even had thick, sloped armor. 
However, World War II ended before the Centurion got the chance to prove itself against German armour. But there's still the original question. Were British tanks really that awful? Despite everything I've mentioned, the answer is still very much open for interpretation, but my personal answer is no. It's true that Britain did give birth to some truly awful tanks, such as the Covenanter, a tank that had its radiators positioned at the front of the tank because there was no room in the engine bay. But Britain also produced tanks that performed exceptionally well in the right circumstances. The Matilda II's armour proved superior in North Africa. So much so that the only way Germany could reliably knock them out was with their 88mm anti-aircraft guns. And even the Churchill tank, despite being riddled with reliability issues early on, was capable of crossing terrain that other tanks simply couldn't. In Tunisia, a country with mountainous terrain, the Churchill was second to none, with its incredible climbing ability, and was able to provide infantry support where other tanks couldn't get to. It also provided significant support on the D-Day landings. Towards the end of 1944, the Comet entered service, essentially an upgraded Cromwell with better armour and a powerful 77mm gun. And whilst the Centurion may not have made its debut until the very end of the war, it became one of the most successful British tanks, and saw use by over a dozen countries around the world. Tank development is no easy task, and sometimes the most effective way to learn is through experience, and that is exactly what the British did. So don't forget, if you're on Twitch, make sure to claim your drops for a chance to win premium vehicles like the Skoda T, uh, T56, Batchat, or the Type 59G. Uh, additionally, of course, there's a chance to receive 360 days of World of Tanks premium account, some captivating 3D styles, and much more. And after 60 minutes, which I believe should be any time now, if it hasn't already passed, you'll also receive the last and much-needed Road to Tank Fest token, which will bag you a free premium tank. Um, another great video there from Fan the Tank Man. I've noticed on the comments that Fan the Tank Man is becoming very popular. Absolutely. He's done nice really well. Actually, I thought that video was a really well-balanced, presentation about British Army. But this British Army has had a very bad press about its performance in the Second World War, both in terms of the kit and how it was used. But if you look at these dynamics of Second World War British Army, the, the Matilda II in 1940 was the single most powerful land-based weapon system in the world, really. It was absolutely phenomenal. Um, if you look at its performance in the desert, the Italians don't have an anti-tank gun that can touch it either. Um, it's a phenomenal piece of kit. Where there's this dip for the British in the middle of the war, that's driven by the fact that you know, we've left all our tanks behind in France. We're expecting to be invaded, and we're doing high-end technology in a real hurry. And you know, if you work for a video game company, if you work in any any form of technology or engineering, if you're doing high-end technology in a hurry, you get some real problems. And, and that's what the British encountered in the Second World War. And Centurion coming along later on proves that this British manufacturing capability of can we do a really good tank? Centurion, we like Centurion here at the Tank Museum. It's an awesome tank. You know, last 50 years in a bleeding edge technology world, best tank ever. Believe it or not, I had somebody the other day ask me if I actually crewed the Centurion. So I, I it's your era, <laughs> isn't it, Richard? <laughs> I did have to explain that I'm old, but not quite that old. I think it's quite good that Fan did stop, of course, at the end of the Second World War Centurion. After Centurion, British tank design has had a, had, a, had a few more issues, but Centurion proved in every form that we've really had it. There's some great books kicking around I've actually recently written about how you uh, how the British worked in the Second World War. There's I think British War Machine is one of the uh, books about manufacturing. And in terms of how British used technology in the Second World War, I thoroughly commend it to anyone who's uh, to watching or listening today. Um, anything by John Buckley's a really thorough examination of how the British used armour in the Second World War, proving that we are better than the Americans. And of course there we saw, like you say, the Matilda II. Now, I, it is my favourite vehicle of all time, Matilda II. Um, and of course, you always hear the restoration work they did on that, by the way. Incredible. It was a huge job. We, we, um, Matilda II here, we... We had, I had a memorable moment walking into the, uh, the, the tank workshops here. We're seeing the empty hull of a Matilda II uh, with all the bits in stillages piled high all around. And I had this moment where I sort of realised, I think the chaps had told me we needed to tweak the gearbox. 
And it turned out to need quite a lot of teaking. And what you find with these vehicles is that when you lift the lid on them, that the sheer amount of work you have to do, sometimes these vehicles have been run for decades and decades beyond their original design expectancy. And keeping these things working is a monumental task. And I remain full of admiration for the team here and the work that they do. And again, a shout out for, I mean, if nobody's seen the Matilda Diaries, please check it out on your YouTube channel. It's absolutely incredible. So it takes step by step the problems that went on with doing the restoration of it. Um, and I have to say, I, you know, I had the privilege of having a chat with Chris Van um, who's your fleet manager, I believe. And it was what the process the guys went through. But again, you were talking earlier about the learning. I mean, this is a vehicle where, you know, I assume you had supported documentation. I assume you had this, but... Uh, we did, but we also got a lot of help from other people. And I don't know if they're watching them in Australia at the moment, but we had fantastic help overseas. Uh, one of the watchers uh, of Matilda is a, a chap in, uh, in Australia called Matt McMahon. Um, he was fantastically helpful to us, where the, all the Matilda hulls ended up in Australia after the Second World War for, for, for training, and a lot of them used for farming. Uh, so a lot of them had been hoovered up. Uh, and the, uh, the, the big caches of spare parts and actually of expertise on Matilda 2 is down there. Just to give you an idea, though, how intensive the work on these vehicles is, Matilda 2's restoration, when we had a tank that worked with roughly all the bits there, still cost £130,000 wow. to do all the work involved in that vehicle. That's incredible. And we were talking about funding from the, the, the tank museum. Now, of course, ticket sales... Yeah, so we're an independent charity. We get some support from the British government, so the Ministry of Defence helps pay for the buildings. Uh, but we have to generate our own money, and, and we do that by having a great visitor experience, uh, by, by working well as an organisation, making sure that our collections are out there and being used and we can selling the stuff on the shop. And people, like people online today, supporting us through donations. Fantastic. OK, and now we're going to go back to the arena and this time we're going to take a closer look at World War II tank development and an overview with the one and only Mr David Willey. The Matilda one, that thick armour we mentioned, just a machine gun, suppress the enemy position as the infantry followed behind it. Even as it was being built, they start the idea, we're going to need a better one. And that leads to Matilda II, which is made by a brand new foundry it's called the Vulcan foundry company they make the tank for the first time and the idea there is Britain needs more factory space more companies to end up building tanks to build war products it's going to be important so by using a brand new company Vickers can make the things we know Vickers and main manufacturer are very good at the Vulcan company they learn how to build tanks they're using castings, and we put that two pounder gun we've talked about so much and a machine gun on the Matilda 2. Very thick armor again, and it's one of those tanks that causes Hitler to reappraise his own tank force and his own anti tank guns, and that starts him on the Tiger program because of that thick armor that the Germans met when they fought against Matilda 1s and Matilda 2s in the Battle of Arras in 1940. In 1940 as well, when we left all our tanks behind us, uh, Dunkirk and the losses in France, we start another programme for yet another infantry tank. And that's coming on now. That becomes the Churchill. This particular model, Churchill, is a Mark IV. The first Mark I had a two-pounder gun. Uh, they put a howitzer in the hull three-inch howitzer. This is now, they then started putting the six-pounder gun when it was available later in 1941. This is a different gun. It's a bored-out six-pounder. What we realised is tanks, if you meet an enemy tank, you want an armour-piercing round to fire. Quite often, if you imagine you're an infantry tank, a lot of the time it's not about enemy tanks that you're worried about. It's about anti-tank guns, infantry positions, uh, trenches, maybe soldiers in buildings. So you want a high-explosive round. 
and that means a round that blows up and shatters blast effects, being blasting away at the enemy there. The Americans had that gun, the 75mm gun, a medium velocity gun they put on the Sherman tank. We bored out. They made the chamber of the six-pounder a bit bigger, and we could fire their ammunition. So it gave us an anti-armor capability as well as a good high explosive. And again, another small point, but tanks aren't always fighting tanks. An awful lot of their role is fighting infantry dug in or other types of enemies, not just those in tanks. Now, the Churchill was rushed into production. Within a year, they wanted it done. They managed to do that, but the early Churchills had major problems because of that. The manual of the first Churchill tank, basically the first page, says, we know this tank's got problems. Don't worry, we're working on it. Better you have something, they were arguing, than nothing at all. But the Churchill, it was going to be abandoned. There was talk of giving it up entirely, but it showed its moment out in North Africa, Tunisian campaign. Churchills could go places, great rate of climb. It could be used for things that other tanks just, they just couldn't get there. And of course, we've just seen the video fantastically as well. It was used for Avery's, armored vehicle Royal Engineers, put a mortar on the front, carry a bridge with it. It's got lovely side doors, so engineers can jump out the side with a bag of explosive, place them against the seawall, get back in safely, and off you go. So the Churchill became, ironically, despite its poor early beginnings, a great British success. And now another great British tank from later in the war. This is a cruiser tank. Now the idea of the cruiser type of tank, they're the ones that if the infantry tanks have attacked, the cruiser tanks go through the gap. Speed was considered important, certainly earlier in the war in Britain. We went for speed, relatively light armour protection. We were less worried about the firepower. We learnt that hard lesson in North Africa. Firepower is really important. The Germans always put it at the top of the list, so did the Russians. So we ended up having a basically a hiatus, a period in the middle of the war, where we were car carry on building those early war tanks, the blessing for us is the Americans come along to us with their M3 Grant tank, then the M4 Sherman. Once we had sorted ourselves out in terms of air power, building bombers, building fighters to defend ourselves, only then could we really go back to making the tank an important priority weapon. And when we did, we actually got it rather right. This is in a development of the Cromwell tank goes into service at the end of 1944. It's got a fantastically powerful 77 millimeter high velocity gun on it. And firing British discarding Sabo ammunition, slug of tungsten surrounded by a lighter pot, developed at Fort Halstead, that gun was better at penetrating armor than the gun on the Panther. And in the back of it, you can hear it rumbling away, that famous Merlin engine, derated from the Spitfire, called a Meteor, over 600 horsepower, so a bit of speed as well. Now, the Americans were used to the idea of using aeroplane engines as well in their tanks. The M3 Stewart tank, the little light tank we saw earlier, that had a radial aeroplane engine put in the back. They put the same radial engine in some of the Shermans, but they didn't have enough of those aeroplane engines. There wasn't enough plane engine spare, which is why the Sherman family 
has so many variations. Four engine types are ended up being used inside the Sherman. And our example of the Sherman running around today, the one we used in that Fury movie, M4A2, this has got a twin diesel engine in the back. Many of those diesel engine Shermans were actually given to the Russians to fight on the Eastern Front. Now the little Stuart tank, Stuart because they were named after American Civil War generals. Churchill was fed up of all the numbers and letters. Give me a name, he said. So they named them after Civil War generals. We've got the Stuart there with a 37 millimeter gun. We saw that's the gun the Americans copied from the Germans. We've got the Sherman, this one now with a bigger 76 millimeter gun. A higher velocity weapon, not quite as good as our 17 pounder, but uh, they start being used from the summer of 1944. It's got a better range, again, with uh, some rare ammunition that the Americans developed. There wasn't enough of it, but hyper velocity rounds, you could just about get through the front armor of a Panther. But there were lots of Shermans. Remember, this is a bit of a numbers game as well. Again, in a short space of time, we've gone from that M3 Stuart. Within a couple of years, they're developing the M24, um, that Chaffee tank we can see sat behind it. Again, that can fire the same ammunition as the early Sherman. So it's upped its firepower. It's a different type of gun. The one, as uh, Tim mentioned, came off a Mitchell bomber. Thinner wall, but the same size ammunition. And behind it, another one of these things that we hear the word used, tank destroyer. This is the American M18 Hellcat. In 1941, the Americans came up with the idea, your tanks are through for breakthroughs. If you want to fight enemy tanks, bring up your tank destroyers. Put a powerful gun, same 76 millimeter gun that's over on that Sherman Fury. Put that on a lightweight chassis and make it fast. That vehicle can go over 50 miles an hour. That's blooming fast for a, a tank of about 20 tons. Got that same radial engine in the back there. Now it's got torsion bar suspension, very thin armor. It's speedy. Get to where the enemy are to try and knock them out. Great in theory. By the end of the Tunisian campaign, already the Americans are starting to think doesn't quite work. You don't have your best bits of kit in the right place to meet the enemy. So they start thinking, we're going to have to put that 76 millimeter gun on the Sherman tank as well. And also, when they met the Tigers, we're going to need some bigger tanks. So we've got there the M18 Hellcat. But that one, by the way, saw service after the war in the uh, war when Yugoslavia was breaking up. What you've got there, again, it's penetrated on the front. You can actually see battle damage there on that vehicle. Now, as we look down the other end of the field, you can see we saw it a little bit earlier. There's that Hetzer. The Germans take a tank chassis. They've captured the whole of the Czechoslovakian tank industry. They start putting their tanks into service. That uh, About a third of the tanks used in France 1940 by the Germans are actually captured Czech tanks. But also they kept on developing it. The Romanians, weirdly, they start making a tiny little tank destroyer. Looks very similar to this. The Germans see it, get the Czechs to copy it, and we end up here with the Hetzer. And the idea there of that Hetzer it's got that 75 millimeter gun, it's low profile, and it's also, they call it a Panzer Jaeger, tank destroyer. But by this stage of the war, when it's coming into service, they know where the enemy is. They know they're being attacked all the time. They don't need a turreted 360 turning turret on a normal tank. So again, you can imagine a low profile vehicle like this, sat in a hedgerow somewhere, picking off as an ambush weapon. Crew conditions inside that vehicle, pretty appalling, very tight, not a great amount of space there, but an effective weapon nonetheless, and a kind of development. In the 1930s, the Germans wanted self-propelled artillery to go forward with the infantry. Manstein argues for the Sturmgeschutz, as they called them, and those vehicles ended up crossing over from being support to the infantry. Let's put an anti-tank gun on them. Hitler loves the idea. You can make more of these cheaper. 
the cost of a Sturmgeschutz is uh, you can build three Sturmgeschutzes for the price of two turreted tanks. So in other words, you can get more value for your money. And again, so the Hetzer, if they perhaps the war had gone on to, uh, longer, another year or so, you'd see more variants of these Panzer Jaeger, a big gun put on a small chassis, developed towards the end of the war, uh, more of them would have been coming into service. So that's our German representation at the moment. But again, if you go back in the museum, you can see there from we had with our very first, with our Panzer I that we had running around this morning, two machine guns. Um, and then we end up at the end of the war, 128 millimeter, huge great big gun put on that Yak Tiger, all in that very short space of about five years. You know, that is a tremendous development. And another country that took firepower very, very seriously were the Russians. They are the ones that in the 1930s were building tanks in the tens of thousands. They're the only country in the world that actually went ahead. Most other countries just experimented. And what ended up there with the T-34 uh, starts the war with a 76 millimeter gun, sloped armor that everyone talks about, reliable diesel engine in the back. And by the end of the war, it's got an 85 millimeter gun. They were meeting the Panther at the Battle of Kursk. They wanted to upgun it. They did think of building a new tank, the T-44, changed their mind and put a bigger turret with an 85 millimeter gun on. So one of the things we can see with these vehicles here is um, we've got one each of these things running around. In a combat situation, in a combat situation, of course, there would be many, many more of these vehicles. And uh, one of the things that it seems an obvious thing to say, but in tank warfare, numbers count. So it's not just the fact that there was one of those Shermans or one of those T-34. 49,000 Shermans made during the war by America, given to the Britain, given to the Commonwealth companies, countries, given to the Free French, given to Russia. That T-34 that we can see again down there, um, estimates up to about 68, 69,000 T-34 variants. Huge numbers of tanks. And again, in the end, it's going to be that quantity, not just the quality, that could swamp some of that late war German quality on the battlefield. And we've also, don't forget, got that air force that are bombing the factories, stopping the Germans making fuel, spare parts, more tanks. Uh, and that's all part of that Allied success story.
Now, there's some rare bits of World War II armour running there. Sadly, I was informed just before we came on, the uh, we had hoped to have the Centaur, looks like a Cromwell, coming on. It didn't like the hot weather, refuses to start, I'm afraid. So sorry about that one, not being out there. But uh, it is worth pointing out, most of these vehicles are all older than most of us here today. Um, we're getting a little bit hot, tetchy, tied around the edges. Uh, imagine these vehicles, you know, they are, it's quite hard to keep nurturing these. And we always say to the drivers, don't be afraid to pull over if uh, the temperature gauge is going up too much. Uh, we don't want to do anything nasty with them. Now that Comet, I'm just going to let you listen. The Comet that's driving around at the moment, that's the one with that Meteor engine in, that Spitfire engine, derated. Suddenly we've got over 600 horsepower. This is a vehicle that can move and therefore we can put, we've got speed, we've got power to put more armour protection on and that great 77 millimetre high velocity gun Vickers comes up with at the end of the war projectile coming out same size as a 17 pounder a very effective bit of kit We're here live from Tank Fest 2023 here at the Tank Museum in Bobbington in the south of England. We've just seen the most fantastic display of original Second World War running armour. Fantastic. The sound has been awesome. Uh, Richard, what was your favourite bit of that display? Well, when you talk of sounds, I mean, the Churchill is like nothing else. And I hope that you know, people watching at home can actually pick up the noise level when it goes past. It's incredible. Churchill, is, it's, there's so much metal on metal with Churchill. It sounds like a total bucket of bolts, doesn't it? I, I, I've got to go agree. I think it's the best, worst-sounding tank in the world ever. It's tremendous. <sighs> Now we're going to go to another video, and I mentioned it earlier, we're also teaming up this year with the incredible veterans with dogs. And just to explain a bit more, here is somebody who's going to become an all-time star, Ferris. I'm very proud again this year to introduce Ferris, um, the fantastic Ferris here. He's brought along his, his two-legged friend, <laughs> Brian, from Veterans with Dogs. Brian. Once again, thank you for coming back thank this you. year. Uh, Ferris, lovely to see you again. How's your year been? We've had a good year. Um, Ferris goes from strength to strength. Uh, and of course, this year he's got a new set of skills. And we're going to check out those set of skills in a minute. But just for those who are not aware, Brian, can you just remind us what it is that Veterans with Dogs do? Sure, yeah. We're uh, a small charity based in Exeter in uh, southwest England. Uh, we provide assistance dogs for veterans with PTSD. So. Um, these are dogs that look after their partner, spot the signs where they're not feeling too good, just generally support them and allow them to get their lives back, back together. And as far as training, Brian, I mean, what, what sort of length period are we talking about? I assume, do you always get the dogs as puppies or do you... They we do, yeah. Um, so they get socialised for about 12 months with a volunteer wow. socialiser. Then they go to their, their partner, so it's their, their veteran partner that trains them. We help them do that, but it, it, it's the, the partnership, the journey that the pair of them go on. And then after about another 12 months, so two years in total, that's when they become a partnership and they can go out in the world together on their own. Fantastic. Um, and as we sort of mentioned there, people will see online at the moment, we have got Ferris has become famous in yes, game. Yeah. Um, his face appears in game, we've got a 2D style with him and I believe that he's, uh, he's learned to play World of Tanks in the last 12 months. He has, yes. Thanks to you guys, Ferris has a, a new skill as a tank commander. Well, I think you're going to have to prove that now. <laughs> yeah.
When I joined the Royal Tank Regiment in 1983, Cold War tensions were high. We trained for the day when Soviet forces might have invaded across the East German border. If they had done so, they would have been spearheaded by tanks like this, the T-72. Fortunately, that day never came. But if it had, we would have been waiting for them in this, the Chieftain main battle tank. So how would these legends of the Cold War fared in a face-to-face -face confrontation? Let's start with the British-designed Chieftain, weighing in at 55 tonnes. Developed in the 1950s, it was adopted as the British Army's MBT in the 1960s, being retired in favour of Challenger 1 in the 1990s. It's got presence, it's got prowess, but rather unfairly, it doesn't have the best reputation. That's because of the Leyland L60 engine, which in its early incarnations was horribly unreliable. The issues were pretty much sorted by the time I joined up, but it remained a relatively maintenance-hungry beast. It was a powerful engine though, being able to push the Chieftain to 30 miles per hour. And when it did fail, the entire engine and cooling system could be removed from the vehicle and completely replaced in less than two hours, keeping operational downtime to a minimum. So that was absolutely fantastic. So good to get back in the driver's cab of Chieftain. Now, of course, a bit heavy, a bit heavy on the steering, uh, gear changes. I'm certainly very rusty and they could have been a lot better than they are, but what a joy. Its weight came from its standout feature, its armor. The frontal armor was 120 millimeters thick. The turret was even better with the addition of steel brew. It certainly gave us great confidence in the protection offered by this tank. But perhaps the best feature of the Chieftain was the formidable 120mm L11 A5 rifle gun. It was capable of accurately engaging targets at long distances. In fact, the L11 A5 still holds the record for the longest tank versus tank kill, which it achieved whilst mounted in a Challenger 1 tank in 1991. The Chieftain carried 64 rounds of main armament ammunition, both APDS, armoured piercing discarding sabo, and Hesh, high explosive squash head so we can engage both hard and soft skin targets as the situation dictated. Now the turret itself is pretty roomy and you'll see the difference once we jump into the T-72. Next, the T-72, the tank we trained endlessly to fight. Emerging in the 1970s, the T-72 became the most numerous tank in the Warsaw Pact arsenal. It remains in service today, the T-72B being the most numerous tank in the modern Russian army. Unlike the Chieftain, the T-72 was exported to a range of other countries, with over 25,000 being built, compared to the 900 or so Chieftains in British service. Unlike the Chieftain, the T-72 has been thoroughly tested in wars, featuring in over 30 conflicts around the world, including the current war in Ukraine. At 41 tonnes, it's visibly smaller, and with a top speed of 45 miles per hour, it was designed to be agile, with torsion bar suspension ensuring a smooth ride. Well, the weight difference certainly shows there. It is so responsive compared to the Chieftain. It corners really, really well, and is actually really quite fast. The speed advantage comes with a compromise in armor thickness to lessen the weight. The armor lacks the sophistication of that of the Chieftains. The main armament for the T-72 was a 125 mm smoothbore gun supported by a laser rangefinder. It was a simple but effective fire control system. As the gun is an autoloader, there is only a requirement for a crew of three, as opposed to the four required for Chieftain. Now this doesn't make the turret any roomier, as you can clearly see. The Soviets used to often sacrifice ergonomics and comfort 
for design and economy. So how do they stack up against each other in a fight? The chieftain's strength would come in the form of its thick armour, powerful gun and highly trained professional crews. Our strategy, if attacked by the Soviets, was to occupy pre-prepared positions and pick off the approaching enemy T-72s in the hold down positions. We would have felt pretty comfortable and confident in our abilities, our vehicles and those of our NATO allies. But the T-72s can move fast and there were a huge number of them. Our biggest fear was that we would be outnumbered and overwhelmed, with the T-72s flanking or encircling our positions. But not all Soviet crews would have been as well trained and motivated as we were. And we have seen in Ukraine how poor logistics, low morale, low confidence in superiors, etc., can have a significant impact on the will to fight and dramatically change the outcome of any battle. Despite the dramatic strengths and weaknesses of both of these vehicles, we must conclude that the best tank is the one with the best crew. Throughout history, tanks have been designed to be able to use different types of ammunition, and the two main ones are usually armour-piercing and high-explosive rounds. But one type of ammunition that isn't often covered is the smoke round. The smoke round, as the name suggests, causes a large and lasting burst of smoke on impact, usually done by burning white phosphorus. In the past, it's often been used as a way of blinding or obscuring enemy observations. This does, however, make it difficult to use on oneself or on friendly units. Nobody wants a friendly unit firing a smoke round at them. However, as time went on, new and more effective ways of deploying smoke have been developed. Nowadays, almost all armoured fighting vehicles come equipped with a set of these, smoke grenade launchers. A cluster of smoke grenades that can be launched at the press of a button to obscure oneself from an enemy force. These are ideal if a crew are in a situation where they need to make a tactical withdrawal. Some vehicles are even capable of creating their own smoke screens, such as the T-72 and Challenger 2. This is done by spraying diesel onto a hot exhaust, which then causes a huge amount of non-hazardous white smoke to be thrown out of the exhaust. And there's a good chance you'll see this being demonstrated at Tankfest during some of our displays. Welcome back to Tank Fest 23, live here at the Tank Museum. Um, I have to say, Richard, I was watching that video back, Chieftain versus T-72, and I have to admit, I'm very embarrassed at some of those atrocious <laughs> gear changes on the Chieftain. It's shocking. <laughs> I mean, out of practice, we'll give you that. No, that, the thing is, I mean, that was your, that's the era of tank you were looking at and working with, and that T-72 would have been the one opposite you. How would you have felt if you were in a T-72 rather than the Chieftain? Well... I, yeah, it's a very good question. I think, like we said in the video there, I mean, it's the sheer numbers that were the worry. Now, we had no doubts at all. No, Chieftain, of course, gets a really hard time for many reasons. And, you know, a lot of it is valid. But, of course, we loved it. And the thing, you know, saving grace was that incredible 120 millimeter gun um, and the armour. So, you know, we felt fairly confident. Is it OK to say that? Yes, it was, it was one of those things that was sort of, the sort of extraordinary tension. People forget now how the Cold War felt at the time. And I sort of remember sort of seeing all the numbers about how many tanks we've got and how many they've got and the, all the dynamics of trying to figure out who's, who's looking to attack who and where are these angles coming from. I mean, you were part of it in terms of, you know, you were right at the front of it. How, how did it feel? for your war in the Cold War? Well, I think, firstly, of course, you don't actually think about it, do you? I mean, I was incredibly young when I joined... Uh, <laughs> when I joined the regiment based in Germany. And, yeah, you're right, though, but our lives consisted of preparation for the worst, um, crashing out to these pre-deployed positions, uh, all the recognition, all the airfield recognition was all about you know, Russian hardware, Russian tanks. Um, so it's all the... You know, Preparations. <laughs> and it's Not going on behind us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just another day at the Tank Museum, ladies and gentlemen. The, uh, it's, uh, you'd be surprised what happens behind you at this kind of place. The, uh, yeah, and the, so if you look at T-72 as a system, and we've got, a, a, yeah, for instance, a Polish T-72 here, where it's the Poles who are opposite the British. Uh, and they were the ones that the, uh, yeah, the Polish battle plan would have been going through the British up to Denmark or across the Low Countries. That, that's a, was that sort of per, a perpetual tension, or was it the... Again, I think, obviously, as far as you're concerned in the British Army, it seems to have been, when I joined a young man, it seemed to be going on for so long. It was almost the norm. Does that make sense? It does, it does, it, yeah. It was, um, so again, it was just, you know, it was one of those things that we never 
we, we never thought anything was going to happen. But of course, as you do in the army, any army around the world, you prepare for the worst. You do. And the Cold War was in some ways the greatest era of tanks expected to dominate the battlefield. The size, scale and impressiveness of these systems as you were going through that period reached new heights. And we have a fantastic Cold War collection here at the Tank Museum. And the next live display is going to be showcasing that for people here and for you live from the Tank Museum. I'm going to hand over now to our commentator for this segment. He's our very own Chris Copson. Uh, they are all constructed the same. The turrets change. The first T-34 had a 76mm gun in a two-man turret. This T-34-85 has got an 85mm. Um, the Sherman is rather different. There are lots and lots of Shermans, but there are lots and lots of different types of Sherman as well. Because in a capitalist society, you can't tell everybody what to do. So, we have different hull designs and up to six different engines going into more or less the same tank. The third tank, just parked up in the forming up area, she will come on very shortly again is a wonderful British tank. This is the Centurion. Now, the Centurion just misses World War II. The Centurion, British tank design has been get, getting better throughout the war. So we've been putting out some good tanks like the Comet. Um, but the Centurion, what we're heading for, um, in the past we've had cruiser tanks, we've had light tanks, we've had infantry tanks. What we need is the un universal tank. And this is a tank that can do anything you want it to. And Centurion is just about there. That concept, and this is what you're going to see now, will develop into the main battle tank. And that is really the sort of theme of the Cold War period, the MBT. Now, these tanks are getting bigger and tougher. The average weight of a tank in World War II is probably about 25, 35 tonnes. Um, they're up into the 40s and the 50s, and modern MBTs, if you take a Challenger 2 with all her extra armour, she's actually up to 74 tonnes. That's a huge amount of weight. The MBTs, what they're going to do is they will come and do a couple of circuits of the arena. They'll do a couple of figure eights so you can all have a good look. You may not be able to hear me because these things are astoundingly noisy. And we have damped the track down as much as we can but do be aware, they will probably kick up a lot of dust. So you can see, coming onto the arena now, we have two Centurions. Behind them, there is a West German Leopard 1, and then an American M60. So as I say, they're going to come on, they will uh, do a couple of circuits, then park up. When they park up, uh, right at the end of the display, I will do uh, talk about them individually, but in between, we'll have a look at some lighter armour, some recce vehicles, because it's not all about tanks. We're going to bring on things like armoured cars and anti-tank vehicles as well. So you get a full range of the sort of vehicles that were around during the Cold War. Now, the Centurion, um, there are two of them there. And, like I said, a British tank. But the big thing about Cent... It was an excellent tank. It's one of the best ever built. Um, I don't know if anybody in uh, the audience who's my age had the dinky model of the Centurion tank. It's the classic tank. If you ask a small child to draw a tank, they'll effectively draw a Centurion. It's that shape, that turret. These two, both manufactured in Britain, but the thing about Cent is she was a phenomenal commercial success. They saw how good Centurion was, every Bonte wanted to buy Centurion. So an awful lot of the um, NATO countries, Commonwealth countries wanted to buy Cent. And the first tank, the first Centurion leading on here, is a Dutch Centurion. So she is owned and maintained, beautiful order, by the Royal Netherlands Army Heritage Collection. And the second century that's just passed me now, 
That's a Swiss Centurion. We then have the West German Leopard 1. I gave up on commentary as they were passing me. I think it's sometimes just good to listen to the noise these things make. They are awe-inspiring machines, they really are. So you've got the West German Leopard 1. The sandy-coloured one behind that is an American uh, M60. We've then got um, a squat-looking vehicle with a very long gun. That's a T-72. And then we're into British Army territory because you have a chieftain Behind that, a Challenger 1, and then the French uh, light tank flying the Tricolor, that is an AMX 30. So the big tanks are going to come round and park up. As I said, I will talk about them in a bit more detail on their second evolution, but we're going to get some light armour on. but I'm sure you're all noticing um, things have changed a bit since World War II, haven't they? These tanks are much bigger, bigger, tougher, meatier. The lead Centurion, which is the, uh, the Dutch Centurion, is unusual. Um, Cent was um, changed about during the course of her very long career. Starts off life with the World War II 17 pounder gun. She's then upgunned to uh, a 20 pounder, uh, all British guns, and then finally, a very famous tank gun of the 1950s into the 60s, which is the L7 105 millimeter gun. So the big tanks are all paused now, and the lighter vehicles are going to come on into the arena. They will just do one evolution. I'll talk about them as they're passing. So we've gone from wheels to track, tracks to wheels rather. Um, there's a bit of a debate about which is better because it's not all about main battle tanks. They're also reconnaissance vehicles. Now I know a lot of recce stuff is done by drones and satellite, things like that these days. In the past, recce vehicles were absolutely invaluable and the advantages of a recce vehicle like that AML 90 the French one they are quieter as you can hear they're faster especially on the road a wheeled vehicle may not go everywhere a tracked vehicle can go but in terms of reconnaissance those Particularly the quietness and the speed, those are major advantages. Recce vehicles are usually light, lightly armed. Uh, that little French uh, AML, it only weighs five and a half tonnes. And that's an advantage because it's a reconnaissance vehicle. It's also air portable, which if you need to get it places, that's a big consideration. Behind the AML, the sandy coloured one is British Saladin, six-wheeler, very, very tough. The Saladin could run over a mine, lose a wheel and carry on. There is then uh, a Jeep, but it's actually a French Hotchkiss Jeep. And unusually, it's actually mounting a recallless anti-tank rifle. So that Jeep is not really in a position to get into a scrap, but if it's lying in ambush, it has got some anti-tank capability. 
The AML, just passing me now, um, that's quite a big gun for a small vehicle. It's a 90 millimeter gun, um, and obviously a traversable turret. The French were using ferrets, British armoured cars, during their Algerian campaign. They didn't really have enough firepower, so they switched in for uh, the AML. And then the final vehicle in the column that's just gone past me now is another cracking little Dutch vehicle. That is the YPR 65 Pratt. I'll explain what Pratt means in a little while. So the recce vehicles are now making their way off and you can see the advantages of stealth and speed. The one that's going to stay behind is the, the little Pratt. She's going to pause and we'll take a look at her at the end of the big tank display. So the first of the scents is moving off. This is the Dutch Centurion, like I said, operated by a number of different armies. Um, this is a typical modern tank. Four-man crew. So you have got uh, the driver down at the front, uh, and then in the turret, the turret crew, the commander, the gunner, and the loader. It's quite cosy in there. There's not a lot of space. And of course, the thing to remember about tanks, if you're in a live tank, the turret turns, you're inside, bits of the inside move and bits of the inside don't. You really have to know what you're doing. You have to be aware of where all your extremities are. If you've got a foot or a hand in the wrong place, it'll get squished or snipped off. That is really a very, very beautifully restored tank. You can see she's got the 20-pounder gun and she's got big infrared searchlights as well. As I said, that is really, that's a, sort of, that's a child's uh, drawing of a tank, isn't it? Really rather lovely condition. Down the side of the tank, you can see these things, um, which are quite often known as bazooka plates, because they're meant to provide a bit of extra armour protection, especially against hollow point anti-tank weapons, hollow charge anti-tank weapons. Um, they are a bit of a nightmare for tank crew. So if you go too close to a gate post or something solid, you end up smashing them off, and people ask awkward questions. Um, they're also, on occasion, taken off and laid down over uh, boggy ground in order to get the tank across. Now the second scent moving off, very similar to the first, but looking at it, it's a different gun. This is the Royal Ordnance L7 105mm gun, and this gun itself is a remarkable success story. It's used on any number of vehicles. So uh, the other vehicles we've got here today with the 105 gun on are the Leopard, the West German Leopard, and also the American M60. They've all got the same gun because it was so good. Looking at the gun itself, you'll see there's a bulge halfway down the barrel. You see that on a lot of modern tank guns. What that is, is variously, known. we tend to call it a fume extractor. It's also known as a bore evacuator. Uh, when you fire around from a tank gun, the barrel is full of muck. It's full of combusted explosive, all sorts of filth. If you open the breach, that will flow back into the crew compartment. And that is very unpleasant. What the bore evacuator does, it sits around the barrel. It's basically just a hollow uh, cylinder with vents back into the barrel itself. As the round passes up the barrel, pressure forces all that muck and rubbish into the bore evacuator. Um, and then when the breach is open, fresh air comes in from the turret end and it flushes it clear. If you watch a tank gun fire, you'll get uh, the tank gun go back, recoil, come forward, and there's a little puff of smoke at the end. And that is the bore evacuator clearing itself.
The other feature you tend to see on an awful lot of tanks, if you look at the front of the turret, there are a series of cylinders uh, grouped in sixes here. They are smoke grenade discharges, multi-bank smoke grenade launchers. Um, a tank very often encounters um, rather strong opposition, actually wants to lay a smoke screen in front of herself. Now, in modern tanks, there are two ways of doing this. You can either fire a patch of smoke grenades in front of yourself, or with the most up-to-date tanks, uh, what you can do is vent fuel into the hot exhaust, and that will create a massive, massive bank of white smoke. It lays its own smoke screen, and it's very, very effective. Right, moving forward. This is the West German Leopard 1. And the Leopard is really the first serious uh, German manufactured tank. Um, it's named after a big cat, like its World War II predecessors. Um, and it is a superb piece of engineering. Really is. Um, it's got the L7105 gun, um, but it was designed by Porsche. You can't get much better than that. And then built by Krauss Maffei. The Leopard is a different way of looking at tanks. Now, when you think about tanks, Depending on what you want the tank to do, there is a three-part equation. Armour protection, firepower, mobility. You've got to get those right. Now, the designers of Leopard were thinking that tank munitions, particularly heat rounds and things like that, were so powerful, there was no amount of armour that would stop you, that would stop them. So, what they did was to create a tank that was very fast, very hard-hitting, but fairly lightly armoured. That's exactly the opposite of the chieftain that uh, you'll see in just a moment. Moving off now is the American M60. Now, the Americans go into um, the Korean War with the M48. We've got one of those inside the museum. It's the tank that Elvis Presley served on, all that sort of good stuff. But the problem with the M48 is when it's coming across some of the T-tanks, like the T-55, it's starting to suffer. So it's not really up to the game. So American tank designers um, get moving and they create the M60. Once again, they buy the best tank gun of the period. I'm starting to repeat myself here. It's the L7 105mm gun. Very, very good indeed. Um, but the tank itself, now I look at this and I think, my word, that's a very, very tall tank. With tank armour, you can build tanks in different ways. Rolled homogenous armour, which is flat plates that you weld together, or you can cast large components. That big, almost organically shaped turret, that big round turret, that is a massive casting. It's very difficult to do, but it does provide a very good degree of armour protection. But the one thing I think they weren't thinking about is uh, sometimes in a tank, you don't want anybody to see you. You want to go hold down. And you need to be thinking about, well, OK, how can I hide? And the problem with the M60, you look at it, it's really tall. And it's got a commander's cupola on the top, which I think is counterproductive because it actually makes it even taller. Right. This is the opposite. Moving off over on that side of the arena, that is a T-72. Now, you will realise these have been in the news quite a lot in Ukraine because they are still in service, actually on both sides. Um, so this is the T-72. This is really the iconic, what we call T-tank, Soviet designed tank. Um, and the thing that you look at and you think, well, they design an awful lot of tanks that are really very similar. Um, so you can look back from the T-72 right the way back to the T-54, T-55. They're very similar in shape. They are low. They are squat. 
Now, the way you achieve this is you modify the tank crew. So if you think about it, four guys in the crew, um, only one actually needs to stand up to do his job. That is the loader, because he's having to manhandle big heavy tank munitions into the breach of the gun. Do without the loader, and you make the tank a lot closer to the ground. So, at the back of the turret, there is a device called an auto loader, and then right in the base, underneath the turret, uh, is a carousel full of ammunition. There's been a lot in the press lately. Um, top attack weapons, things like Enlor, Javelin, um, munitions dropped from bombs. If you can penetrate the top of the tank, all that ammunition is going to go off, and you pop the turret off, and it flies 100 feet into the air. So you've seen an awful lot of T-72s and similar with their turrets blown off. Um, a gentleman I talked to in the audience um, a minute or two ago said that we ought to have kept the tractor on and pulled the T-72 round behind it. I think that's quite amusing and I think that's a bit of a buck up for Ukraine. The other thing about T-72, it's a fairly sort of basic tank. Um, it is robust, um, easy to maintain, but it also has a very, very big, potent gun. This is a Polish-made T-72. They're manufactured under licence in Poland, in East Germany, in Czechoslovakia. They come from all over the place in the um, former Warsaw Pact. Um, and that's a 125mm tank gun. Very powerful gun in a very low tank. Um, probably just about the most powerful tank gun of the period. So it is a basic, rugged, easy to maintain, hard-hitting tank built in colossal numbers. Now, the next one to move off is going to be a real favourite of mine. Uh, this is the British Army's Chieftain. And Chieftain is the successor to Centurion. Centurion was very, very successful. So we thought, right, we're on a roll here. We'll knock out something even bigger and tougher and better. And it was up to a certain extent. Um, the chieftain is sitting on the mound there. And you can see she has largely cast armour. And she's got a 120mm gun sticking out of the turret. That gun, once again, very powerful indeed. It can fire high explosive. It can fire Hesh rounds, high explosive squash head. Um, and it can also fire APFSDS, armor-piercing, fin-stabilized, discarding sabo. And that is a dart of material. Uh, it's either tungsten or, these days, quite often depleted uranium is used. Um, and that thing comes out of the barrel. It's fin-stabilized, and it's traveling at between 1,500 and 1,800 meters a second. That is unimaginably fast. Um, on poorly armoured tanks, particularly the older T-tanks, um, an AP FSDS round, a fin round, will punch itself in one side and straight out the other. Now the problem with Chieftain, the thing that meant she didn't do so well on the export market particularly, is the engine. The engine is a Leyland L60, and it's a diesel engine, but it has a multi-fuel capability. From the start, um, who here, by the way, who had a British Leyland car? Um, well, you know, we're fellow sufferers. I know they're not quite the same company, but from the start, the L60 Multifuel was plagued with problems. It's a very neat design. Go and have a look at one of the tank story hall. It's a power pack. So you've got the engine, transmission, uh, cooling systems, fans, everything in together. So changing an engine you, is something you can do very quickly. You just winch one in. 
uh, which one out, put another one in. The bad news is you'll probably have to do that quite often. They said about Chieftain, she's the most powerful tank in the world as long as she breaks down in the right place. We now have Flying Fox. This is a British Challenger 1 tank, the successor to Chieftain. Now, the origins of um, Challenger 1 are a bit complicated. The British Army is working on a project called MBT-80, Main Battle Tank 80, as a successor uh, to Chieftain. We don't really get very far with it. Um, the one remaining um, prototype is actually in the Vehicle Conservation Centre. Um, but then the Shah of Iran is asking for a tank from his, uh, his army, and he wants an upgrade of Chieftain. He's going to call it Shur. Then he gets deposed in the Iranian Revolution, MBT-80 is scrapped, and we inherit what was effectively going to be going to Iran. There are quite a lot of things that are different from uh, Chieftain to Challenger 1. Um, she has not the same engine, but she has got the same gun. She has got that 120mm uh, rifled gun. A Challenger 1 currently holds the record for a tank on tank kill in um, Iraq. Knocked out a T-tank the range of 5.1 kilometres. Remarkable piece of shooting. Now the other thing you notice is the shape's changed. No longer rounded, organic. Um, we're all flat plates. And the reason for this is the change in armour. We've gone from cast steel armour to composite armour. So, each of those flat panels on that tank is a high-tech sandwich of different materials. So you will have things like ceramic tiles. You might have depleted uranium in there. High-tech polymers. Uh, a massive sandwich of material, and it's very, very difficult for any sort of tank ground to penetrate those layers. It provides very, very good protection. Just about every tank in the world, Challenger 2, Abrams, they all now have composite armour. The problem is it's flat plates and you can't bend it, hence the change in shape. Now the vehicle that's just moving off is the Pratt and this is a Dutch, um, it's an anti-tank vehicle. Pratt is Panzerup's anti-tank, so it's an armoured tracked anti-tank uh, rocket launcher and it's got um, it's carrying what's called, what are called tow missiles in a hammerhead turret. Now the base of the vehicle is a very reliable thing. It's the American M113 armoured personnel carrier. But the superstructure has been changed totally. As I said, you've got that hammerhead turret. Tow missiles. Tube launched optically sighted, wire-guided missiles. They are very effective. They have really quite a long range. One of those will kill a tank 3,600 metres away. So they comfortably outrange tank guns. And then finally, a bit of a favourite of mine, this is the French-designed AMX. Now, this is a light tank with a big gun. It's, again, got a 105mm gun. But the interesting thing about this one, French tank designers are very inventive, um, quite quirky, and they build some really good, very effective vehicles. As she goes past, look at the turret. It's in two parts. It's what's called an oscillating turret. So uh, the gun sits in the top bit. Uh, the bottom bit is sitting on the turret ring and attached to the hull and then the two move together. Now this has advantages. It means you can mount the gun quite high, which is always good news. 
Um, it uh, also means that if you want to fit an auto loader, that just sits next to the gun in the top half of the turret. Um, so it's, it's certainly got advantages. And as I said, this is a French light tank with a very, very big gun for its size. I suppose the disadvantage really is you've got a turret that's in two bits. So if anything hits it, it's not going to have the same structural integrity of a one-piece solid lump of metal. But for all that, I think that is a very good-looking little tank. And like I say, that is packing an awful lot of punch for its size. French vehicles, as I said, quirky, idiosyncratic, but actually very, very good news. Right, so that is a little bit of a sight of Cold War weaponry. I'm going to hand you back to Steve Bully, and you're going to go on to look at something totally up to date, the modern British Army. Thank you very much. hope you enjoyed that. Round of applause for Chris Copson, one of the team here at the Tank Museum. He's our content and research officer talking us through that amazing display. Did you enjoy that? Yeah? Now, who here, there's a reason why I'm asking this, because they are here already. Welcome back. We are live here in Bobbington for Tank Fest 2023. We've just seen the Cold War exhibition there. Uh, the, it is a fantastically awe-inspiring display, especially when you've got lots of vehicles going at the same time. What you don't feel watching at home is how the ground shakes as these vehicles go go past but well, yeah we only had seven or eight vehicles at a time there Richard you've seen many more that goes past how does it feel when the whole armoured regiment is on the move oh my goodness for a regiment I mean you like you say the ground shakes it's incredible I mean it's just um it's I mean it's a buzz there's no other way to put it really <laughs> than it's a buzz to be amongst it and to hear it now you're a tank soldier for 30 years and you you served through at least three generations of armoured vehicles during the cold war you went from chieftain challenge one challenge two what what was the change that you saw in that time? Good heavens. Well, I mean, from a technology perspective, the, I mean, from Chieftain to Challenger 2, no comparison, of course. And I mean, Chieftain, you saw it there. I mean, a good comparison there between Chieftain and Challenger 1 going around the track. Um, the engine, absolutely fantastic. The whole way you drove was completely different because now you could actually speed up going across bumps. You didn't have to think about it so much. The ride was a lot better. And of course, because the ride was better on Chancho 1, it meant that you were firing on the move was better. So it increased everything. We had thermal observation and gunnery systems were introduced into it. So again, not great when you're a soldier. Now the ability <laughs> to, to operate in a 24-hour period was there. Um, it was... I mean, just a vast difference. And then, of course, when you go from Changer 1 to Changer 2, I have to be honest, I've always thought it was the wrong name to use because, again, it was a completely it's a different, different tank. It was a different tank. I mean, it was an absolutely vastly different tank. Hydrogas suspension as well. And reliability. I mean, to compare probably Chieftain to Changer 2, you just can't do. You know. My, my favourite line always about Chieftain is best tank in the world, so long as it broke down in a good firing <laughs> position. And it was a fair point. I mean, I would argue, though, that as a chieftain crew, you got to learn all the workarounds. So we had this thing called Don 10, which was like electrical wire um, that you could, you know, fix things like the fuel injection pumps when they used to go, which they used to go on a regular occurrence as well. So, yeah, it was an experience. But Shanja 2, fantastic. Um, but, of course, there wasn't a lot a crew could do repair-wise. It was now up to the, the REMI, the Royal Electrical and Mechanical Engineers. Um, I had absolutely, one of the things I love about Tank Fest is the ability to wander around for a couple of days and meet up some incredible people. Um, and I've been very fortunate that we got a chance to have a chat with those, some of these people. And we're going to kick off now with an interview with an absolute YouTube legend. We're here now in the Vehicle Conservation Centre and I have just bumped into the incredible YouTuber, Mr Colin Furge. Now, Colin, how, I mean, inventor, sort of garage mechanic, how would you describe yourself? I never know, really, because some people call me a YouTube engineer, but I think that's slightly over. What is a YouTube engineer? Well, exactly, <laughs> just someone who's an engineer on YouTube, but I'm not an engineer. I used to be a plumber. In my spare time, I used to start making things, weird, wacky creations. I'd film it, put it online, and this is like going back to like 2006, years ago, and obviously it just started to gain in popularity. 
to the point where you guys have started sponsoring me to build <laughs> things like this. What I mean, what got you into it in the first place? I mean, why? How suddenly one day you're a plumber and think, Do you know what? I'm going to make some inventions and uh, upload it. Well, I've always liked mucking around with stuff. Kid used to build for Lego, Meccano. When I was a plumber, I tried to design my own plumbing tools. You know, I'd often come across a situation where we thought, oh, we're getting in a right mess here. We've got to be a better way of doing this. So I've always been kind of like quite creative. And then as I've got older, like your toolkit gets a bit better and you start tinkering around with stuff, more and more things. And then very strangely, when my dad was alive, I worked a lad in the shed. And then he unfortunately <laughs> passed, but the keys to his shed passed to me. So I could then get in the shed, start building stuff. And that was at the time where YouTube started to become a thing. So it all kind of like took off. So if you go right back to the beginning of my YouTube channel, I didn't used to make an awful lot. So you can kind of see my growth as a builder come on, you know, go through the ages all online around the videos as things slowly progress. Was there a point where you thought, you looked at the YouTube channel and thought, I'm really surprised at the popularity here and how it's growing or... I mean, it's brilliant, you know, to anybody that ever uploads anything to any platform and gets likes and comments, you know, it is like, it's a good feeling factor in there. People like it, they get, not addicted to it maybe, but probably, you know, and it's like, it's just positive feedback, isn't it? And everybody likes that. Um, I mean, I'd love to know the thought process. So I watch your videos and sometimes I think, how would it, do you just suddenly think that would be a good idea? Is it like a light bulb moment kind or something? Kind of, right? yeah. I mean, my dream always was to make YouTube videos for a living, and I've been doing that now for quite some time. And essentially, when people go, well, how's it work then? I go, well, if I wake up one morning... We are live. We are a tank museum, <laughs> so don't worry. Um, so if I wake up one morning with a really stupid idea, but think that would make an entertaining video, then technically I can go into the shed, start making that, start filming it, and that's kind of my work now. <laughs> it's brilliant. It is fantastic. So. We brought a couple of your projects down with us. Um, let's talk a bit more about it. I mean, what was the thought process behind? So this is the screw tank. Now this is based off the old Zill machines, mm -hmm. which I think were developed to go across like the Serbian wastelands and bogs and stuff. And the real, the realise I really like this. Sorry, the realise the the reason why I really like this machine and why I made it is because it just looks so odd. Do you know what I mean? With these two screws yeah. against it, I thought, oh, that's a machine. I want to know what that feels like to drive. That looks like a lot of fun to make. Not many people have seen these. And also, unfortunately, with my job, you kind of have to think of the title of the video and the thumbnail and work backwards. And I'm like, that's an interesting picture. So, and, and, and then so I started getting cracking and unbelievably this project just worked straight out of the box. I got a um, hydraulic motor, hydraulic pump, pl plumbed it all in, basically made a, a rudimentary frame for it, put a seat in it and it just worked. So from start to finish, I mean, how long do you think it took you to, to create? Um, it was probably about three or four weeks, but it did go through a few iterations because there was like the first version, which was just the basic frame, and then we added all the tank into it so it would float more because it did float before, but the buoyancy level was a little bit low and my, my bum was in the water, basically. <laughs> so the water level would be up here. So it floated, but it needed that little bit of extra buoyancy. And then after that, we covered it in like painting and put, some, like, put a flamethrower and a big potato gun on the side of it. So, oh, when you took it out, I mean, was it, did you have lots of problems to start with? Do you always go through this process, is there, you know, the trial and error process to start with? There is trial and error process. With this one, it was, it was mostly good. We'll get onto this one in a minute. So, but no, other than the, want to have a hydraulic valve added, because when you push the lever, if you just do one lever, it kind of just turns one screw and it will basically turn. But the other one didn't lock up, so it kind of shoved it. So it kind of made a bit of a mess to try and turn in. But just added that valve and that sorted it all out. You must have a big so, garage. Yeah, well, actually, <laughs> where I make stuff's not that big. Like, the actual shed where I build stuff is not much bigger than a normal garage. So, storage, got stuff everywhere. <laughs> Tom, who I, who I do stuff with, he's got bits randomly all over his farm and everything. Um, so, and this one, I mean, visually, wow. So this is the latest. <laughs> Thing. This hasn't even been on the internet yet. Basically, this is what I call the. Well, it's a concept based on the rhino, mm -hmm. which yep. was like a. It was an American inventor who saw a tractor getting stuck in Central Park, and he thought, wouldn't it be great if the wheels got wider as they went up? So the further it sinks in the mud, technically the more traction it gets. But then when you're on concrete, solid ground, you're just running on these treads. So that does work very well. <laughs> it does make it kind of unstable because you're making a nice roll thing. So if you go onto anything sideways. It kind of because you've only like on initially on this sort of tread pattern, then it can feel like it's literally just going to roll over on its own wheels. But um, but this particular one, this used to be a little Thwaites one-ton dumper. Okay, yeah. Brilliant yeah. machines that carry and rubble around 
building sites and everything, but it hasn't quite got enough torque for this to like climb up anything of any steep incline. But it's brilliant. And also, we've articulated, because I thought, I'll do it articulated, because these are going to be a right pain to steer, isn't they? Most oh, absolutely, like yeah, that. yeah. So I thought, articulated is the way to go. But if you think of every articulated vehicle, you're normally on the back, looking at oh, the yeah, front wiggling. Yeah. When you're in the front and the arse is wiggling, you, when you car in reverse, you look back, and because these are all bent and everything, you think you're going back in a straight line, and then you'll look around the other way, and the whole thing's like twisted over nearly. It's the right pig to drive. Is it's this, quite good fun. Would you say was, this is one of the more complicated projects you've taken on at the moment? Or? Um, it was, yeah, I mean, it's not super simple. I had to widen the wheelbase out on the dump, and I had to tilt them all at 15 degrees, so all the hydraulics had to be extended. The steering hydraulics used to be up here, because as a dump truck, you used to sit on top of the engine and then your feet in the front yeah, so that all had to come through the articulation. So there's a little bit of engineering <laughs> to do there. But other than that, it was quite simple. It was just quite time-consuming. It's absolutely fant fantastic. And I think we've had one video out about this. So there's more, yeah, there's, more there's to come three, in there. There's three. There's two, two of me building it and then one of me testing it. Fantastic. So. And I'm, I don't know if you're allowed to share with us anything coming up, Colin. Any ideas going through that mind of yours? Oh, there's always <laughs> stuff. We've got more tunnel. I've been built, digging a tunnel underneath my house. Um, the bit underneath the house is done, but we've got to send it down the back garden to connect to the bunker. And then also, I want the car coming up out the drive. So you can imagine this, like, just coming up outside your drive, in front of your house. Right, yeah, that sounds simple. There's a dream. <laughs> Brilliant. Colin, thank you so much for your time. Um, absolutely, absolutely awesome you to be there. First tank fest? Yeah, it is first tank fest, yeah. Well, hope you See, have been... I like tanks, but I've not been to a tank fest before. Well, there you so go. I can't call myself a two... A true tank enthusiast. And maybe you on. might come up with some new ideas when you see... Who um, knows? Who knows? Who knows? Brilliant. Thank you That's ever so right. much, Colin. Take Thanks care. Your time. It might sound weird, but not all tanks are designed to fight other tanks. The tank was a First World War invention, and it was designed with infantry support in mind. And infantry support remained as one of the key roles for the tank throughout history. Tanks can be used as an effective way to draw the enemy's fire away from infantry, especially considering tanks can also provide fire support, which can be as simple as firing at targets like machine gun positions or bunkers. During World War II, one of the common ways of providing fire support with tanks was with one of these, the High Explosive Round, also known as HE. Essentially, a large grenade in the form of a tank round, and like grenades, they can be modified to either detonate on impact or even use a timed fuse, so they can detonate before or even after impact. Tanks like the M4 Sherman, Cromwell and Churchill all used 75mm guns, and whilst the velocity of these guns weren't particularly high, which is important when you want to penetrate armour, the high explosive rounds used with them were generally very impressive. HE rounds are ideal when used against lightly armoured or even unarmoured vehicles, buildings, machine gun positions and even bunkers and they can also be used as an effective way of suppressing the enemy. And even in the 21st century, although warfare has changed in many ways, infantry support and fire support is still a key role for the tank to perform. And that's why even today, variations and evolutions of the HE round continue to see use. We're here now on the tank park and I've just bumped into Mr. William Bannister, trustee of the Tank Museum, volunteer and avid private collector. How are you, William? You well? I'm very well, thank you very much. It's uh, nice to be back again. And, uh, and number 16, I think the tank fest I've done as a volunteer in various forms over the years. So good heavens. Um, if you've got a moment, we'd just love to yep. have a quick look at your collection. I know you've got something very special, which uh, we've not actually seen before. Well, yeah, we've got, it's, a, it's a small collection here today, but it's the first time we've fielded four vehicles in support of the museum. Uh, the point of the vehicles are they'll all be vehicles that have served the British Army uh, and therefore you'll see some vehicles such as the M8 which everybody normally sees in American livery but actually we did use them in the uh, uh, 1944. So this is a Stuart M3A1, this is the first vehicle I got uh, and we worked very hard on this for many years, the volunteers and I, and uh, she's 1942, we've restored her and she's, she's great fun, she's a bit like a terrier, goes very fast around the arena. Um, this as I say is an M8, Greyhound as the British Army used to call it. We didn't use them very much in, in, in World War II. In 44 onwards, we did try them out. We found that the armour plating on the bottom actually wasn't very good, so our soldiers used to sit on sandbags to make them feel better as they were driving around. So not one of our best vehicles, but actually something that did see action uh, in Italy, and we rarely see it in UK. It must be a very different drive to your, your other track vehicles. Yeah, it's just it was a bit of a whim, and we thought, well, actually, we don't see this normally in British uh, uh, markings, so let's get one and, and see what it's like. But it's very nice to drive. 
she's road registered, so that's the run around for the town. And once again, I mean, the chaps from Armoured Engineering yep, did they've the done work a fantastic on it and, job. Yeah, it looks pristine again, doesn't it? Well, we, we do our best with that. And as I say, Gavin and the team have worked very hard. It's been a, quite a deadline to get these two ready for the show this year. Uh, and to keep it all going. So uh, all tribute to, to, to Gavin and the team for all their hard work. Um, now this is, um, well, very special in my opinion. Well, thank you very much. Um, yes, this is a, a Centaur, um, um, A27. Basically, it's a Cromwell uh, with a Liberty engine. Uh, quite rare, and we didn't want this to go to America. Actually, this was in Band of Brothers. So if you look out for it, uh, it was in Band of Brothers, and it's had a first phase restoration. So we're now just going to try it out for this season so if she breaks down I apologize we've got lots of work to do on it still but we're hoping to shake it down and then we'll take it apart again and get it really pristine in a couple of years time and what was the, I mean what was the passion behind this one when you I when it came I didn't want it to go to America it's, we should have an example at the museum so here it is a running example hopefully and, it, and it's gonna run hopefully <laughs> fingers crossed <laughs> and then we've got the chaffy here at the end which is my favorite as a boy made 1945 uh, British Army had about 300 of these uh, at the end of World War Two, and uh, She's fun and you've had a bit of a go in that one. And you know, so she also is a bit of a sports car around the arena. It's beautiful. And I mean, plans for the future, anything, anything on the cards? Or? A couple more to do. <laughs> uh, a couple more on my bucket list that you keep asking me, but we'll, we'll tell you when I get I them. keep pressing you, but you, yeah, know, you never let slip. So. We've just got to get these finished properly and then we'll get on to the next one. Brilliant. Well, good luck. Good luck with the sensor. I mean, fingers crossed. That... Fingers crossed for a great show for everyone. Brilliant. Thanks Cheers. ever so much, Thanks. William. This is a high-explosive anti-tank round, commonly known as heat. It works using the Monroe effect, which means a shaped or hollow charge is used to send a slug of metal through an armoured target. This is achieved by detonating an explosive charge behind an inverted metal cone. The metal is formed in a fast-moving slug by the explosion, and this punches through the target. Because the armour penetration is based on the explosion and not the impact speed, it means no matter what distance the target is at, the same amount of damage will be dealt. This type of ammunition was first properly used in the Second World War by many different countries in the form of various handheld weapons. The Germans made effective use of hollow charge technology in the form of the Panzerfaust, and the British used it in the form of the Piat. The Soviets later used the technology in one of the most iconic and recognisable weapons of the 20th century, the RPG, or Rocket Propelled Grenade. Hollow charge technology was also developed for use by tanks, in the form of the heat round, and is still used today, although in the form of a thin stabilised version, known as Heat FS. And we're back on the tank park, and I've just bumped into author, historian, broadcaster, Mr. James Holland. How are you, James? I'm well? good, thank you. How are you? I'm very well. I've just heard, and I couldn't believe this to be honest, I was quite <laughs> taken aback. This is going to be your first tank fest. It absolutely is, and it's, uh, it's, uh, I'm embarrassed to admit it. The, the only reason is because we have the um, Chalk History Festival on at the same time. Which is fantastic. Um, uh, but this week we don't. It doesn't start till Monday, so I'm all right. I'm in the clear. Oh, that's brilliant. And what are you particularly looking forward to? Just the whole spectacle, to be honest. What I'm really looking forward to seeing this in action. And let's, I thought while we're here, we'll just um, take a few, have a look around, get your yep. opinion on some of the tank park tanks. Mm. Um, Churchill. I'm yeah, I love see. this tank. I mean, it's an ugly old brute, isn't it? But, but <laughs> I mean, it's got incredible armour, can go up anything. Um, uh, and when you turn it into a crocodile, a flamethrower, it's the most fearsome tank of the war, I would say. I mean, more so than a tiger. And this is going to be, I mean, this, well, fingers crossed, like any of these, it'll be running later on. Well, um, I can't wait, because I've never, ever seen a Churchill running. Um, I've been in most of them, and I've, yeah, but, but just not this one. It looks absolutely awesome. <laughs> yeah, and I'm very, very excited about this. I know my, um, my good friend Al Murray would be very interested to see this one in action, I have to say. He's a big fan of the Churchill. And, I mean, other things, anything else strike your, um, I mean, I would imagine? Well, Hellcats, I mean, you know, they're not tanks, are they? They're tank destroyers. <laughs> they're anti-tank nice. weapons. Um, but, you know, again, it's sort of built on, on fundamentally on the, on the Sherman chassis with, with, with tweaks. But these things are, are, I think it's such a good idea, the idea that you would have a, a really strong, fast, really manoeuvrable, powerful anti-tank mm -hmm. weapon. Um, and, and actually, you can argue that, that manoeuvrability and... and Quick, rapid fire and velocity are really, really key ingredients when you're engaging other tanks and other targets. Um, and obviously, this is to decide. This is designed to destroy Panzers uh, and other tanks that come in its way. And it just looks right. I mean, there's always this theory, isn't it, about aircraft that if it looks right, it probably is right. And I kind of feel that's the same 
I'm talking about the looks, I do think. And what I absolutely love when you see some of these vehicles is when the, the, the add-ons. So we've got the, yeah. the, the box of uh, <laughs> Budweiser there. Yeah, yeah. It's quite nice, the helmets and everything, but it really brings it to life, makes it pop a bit. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I mean, they're extraordinary things, aren't they? Because, you know, they are lightly armoured, of course, which makes them so much faster. And, you know, you've got that sort of open, open turret, but, you know, to see them, they're, they're, it's pretty fearsome, isn't it? I mean, that's a big old gun it's got on it. And... I mean, of course, I've been perhaps the most well-known vehicle ever, I would yes. argue. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I always get a bit cross about Fury because, you know, I always kind of think of that Tiger tank scene. What were they doing going kind of, you know, three abreast across an open field at a Tiger? I mean, just keep firing at it from the woods. That's the obvious thing to do. But I guess that's probably visually not quite as exciting. But, yeah, no, it's always great to see this. And, you know, I'm a big advocate of the Sherman uh, and particularly the up-gun ones. I mean, you know, they're, they're incredibly agile. They're incredibly easy to operate. Um, anyone who can drive a car in America can drive one of these. It's, you know, the only difference is the kind of steering, but, but it's sort of clutch, throttle, brake. It's the same principle. Um, synchro mesh gearbox. Um, what's not to like of this? I mean... And so for Tankfest, James, I mean, anything in particular you're looking forward to? Anything you look forward to on the arena? Yeah, well, I, you know, I'm, listen, I've seen Shermans drive around a, 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 a lot, lot, but yeah. I've never seen the Churchill. I've never seen the Comet. So I'm very much excited about seeing those. Oh, brilliant. Oh, well, I hope you have a fantastic first tank fest and thank you for taking a couple of minutes. To no, thank first. you. This is a high explosive squash head round, better known as HESH, and it does exactly what it says on the tin. HESH is a chemical energy round, and that essentially means that it'll explode on impact. With HESH being made up of a plastic explosive, when it hits a target, the front of the round literally squashes like a pancake. The plastic explosive is then spread out over a large surface area, and when it detonates, it sends powerful shockwaves through the area of contact. If being used against the tank, this will cause pieces of metal on the inside of the tank to be broken off. This is commonly referred to as spalling. Due to Hesh being a high explosive round, it means no matter how far away your target is hit, it'll do the same amount of damage. This is because the damage done by this round is due to the explosives in the round itself and not the velocity that it travels at. Hesh is less useful against the composite armour that's commonly used on modern tanks, as these sometimes contain materials such as rubber and can even have air gaps, which means the shockwaves can be absorbed before they pass through the armour. However, it's still highly effective against lighter vehicles, and Hesh can also be used against buildings and fortified positions, and this is one of the reasons the British have used Hesh for so long and continue to do so. I've just now had a chance to catch up with Mr. Rob Coogan from the US Army Armour and Cavalry Collection. It's quite a mouthful, that, Rob, I guess, it is, it really uh, is. to be honest. Um, Rob, I think your second tank fest, you said, Rob? This is my second tank fest. Yeah, I was here in 19, so it's really good to be back. And how is it going for you? Oh, it's been fantastic. As usual, the people are great, the vehicles are amazing, and the tank museum, as usual, is running just a flawless show. I think it's just, it's just fantastic to be back. And for people who are perhaps not aware, Perhaps you want to tell us a little bit about sure. your location. Uh, so I'm curator of the Armour and Cavalry Collection at Fort Moore, Georgia. Uh, we serve as the Army's teaching collection, so kind of like how the Tank Museum supports the British Army, we support the U.S. Army, both in history as well as research and development. We have over 250 vehicles in our collection. Our main building right now is just under 200. It's a brand new 100,000 square foot display hall uh, that we were given to house the collection. And we've been around since the end of World War II, teaching soldiers. Uh, with the move of the armor school from Fort Knox, Kentucky, down to Georgia. Uh, unfortunately, our mission changed a little bit, so we're not normally open to the public, but now we are starting to open up the collection a couple times a year to share it with people so they can come in, learn about their armor branch, and also about the history of American tanks, as well as foreign tanks that we've encountered on the battlefield. So we have everything from Russian pieces, German pieces captured by the U.S. Army, a little bit of everything. Wow. So, I mean... You are, I mean, I know you're ex-army ex yourself, of yes. course. <laughs> How did you find that transition then from... So, uh, not hard at all. I, I love history, my degrees in history. I volunteered at several army museums during my career, so for me, uh, the hardest part was having to learn how to dress myself instead of wearing a uniform every day. But to teach <laughs> soldiers, to, to use my experience, to use history as a teaching tool, it's fantastic because you're not just telling them what to think, you teach them how to think critically. And, and lessons we see today on modern battlefields go back to lessons that were learned 75 years ago in World War II in many cases. 
So do you think when you talk about, I mean, obviously for us, we've got Shrivenham as well, just, you know, not a million miles away from here, of course, where, you know, I remember as a young soldier going down there and having a look at all this armour yes. um, and being amazed, but seeing, you know, to be perfectly honest, from, it's ne not really changed dramatically. Of course, technology, no, it, technology's advanced dramatically. Technology but. has advanced, but as I always say, the, the, the issues on the battlefield that you face, they haven't changed a whole lot in 100 years. The, there's still the same problems that the soldier faces that his counterpart faced 100 years ago. And uh, there, there's some comfort in that because when you find an issue, that's where history comes to play. Okay, how do we overcome this obstacle? How do we develop a new tactic, a new uh, standard operating procedure? All that's history because at some point something worked and we said, let's keep that. At some point something didn't work, we said, that's a lesson learned, don't do that again. Uh, so that's why I think history is just so important. So the, the collection, your collection, Rob, uh, favorite piece perhaps, and something which you'd love to have which you haven't got? So, mm, gosh, we have a lot of pieces. We have a Mark V star that was used by the American Tank Corps in World War I, a British tank that used by the American Tank Corps. My favorite piece. There's one piece we don't have that I wish we had, would be Michael here because I love Sherman tanks, and this being the oldest Sherman tank, and we have twenty. I was wondering Sherman for a tanks. second I mean, why, yes. why we were in front of Michael. Yes, no, of I love Michael because this is this is this is it for Sherman, and uh, we have twenty some Shermans, but this one being the oldest one, the second one built. And plus, it's it's a great symbol of the U.S. and British relationship over the years. And uh, I mean, you've not got a favorite piece of such as or. Oh gosh, so the, our British Mark V star. Uh, Oh my goodness, yeah. Probably one of the cooler pieces, we have a T-28, the oh, T-28, so oh, course, 95 yeah, tons. Yeah. Uh, Technology-wise, not a big deal, but it's a great conversation piece when you have this big 95-ton tank in the middle of your building and everyone goes, what the heck is that? So Brilliant, and just a final question, Rob. Sure. I always thought for curators coming to other museums, now, is there some sort of ulterior motive when you wander around and think, this is good, I'm gonna take this back with me, or? <laughs> oh no, it absolutely does. Uh, if you're a good curator, you're always going to other museums and seeing what are the best practices and, and taking it back. And I'm really lucky that with the Tank Museum, we're actually part of the TakeNet, which is a network of national yeah. level tank museums. And so we're constantly exchanging good ideas. We're also telling each other what not to do in a lot of cases. Again, one of those lessons learned, it's in the museum industry too. And uh, it's, it's always fantastic to learn from each other. Because there's things and I think of they don't, and there's things they think of I don't. Exactly. Um, I mean, Rob, Rob, super nice to catch up oh, with thank you. Thank you so, you so much. much for coming down. Have a great tank fest. And also, I mean, I know you've got some social media channels. We do. Perhaps it's worth giving a shout out for those. Sure. So uh, you can look up the US Army Armor and Cavalry Collection on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And don't miss it, because they are absolutely fantastic. Oh, and Rob is a great presenter, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very thank much, you. Rob. Thank you so much. If you were to ask the average person, what is tank armor made of, they'll likely say metal. And whilst that isn't incorrect, some tank armor is made up of much more than just metal. In the 1950s, a new type of armor started being developed. Composite armor, a combination of different materials designed to be more effective than regular armor. Imagine a sandwich, except instead of bread, you have steel. And the fillings could be made up of ceramics, plastics, and even rubber. These different materials can reduce the effectiveness of tank ammunition. Composite armor can be very effective against heat rounds, as it's able to prevent the formation of the high-speed jet of metal that this round uses to penetrate armor. The different materials can also absorb the kinetic energy of armor-piercing rounds. The earliest primitive form of composite armor was referred to as steel brew. Thick blocks of steel backed with rubber, which were added to the turrets of the later chieftain main battle tanks. But as time went on, the recipe of composite armor was developed to be more effective. Chobham composite armor was then introduced, and later on came the more modern Dorchester and Dorchester II armor. Composite armor is commonly used in combination with other types of armor to increase its effectiveness, such as explosive reactive armor. But that is a topic for another video. We're here live at Tank Fest 2023 at the Tank Museum in Bovington in the south of England. We're just seeing uh, behind us the uh, fantastic display starting of the British Army, which we'll be moving over to later on. But it's great to see Fam there again. And Richard, you, you've bumped into some really interesting people on the way around <laughs> over have. the it's weekend. Been incredible the last few days. I mean, the, the people there you saw on the videos, I mean, it's absolutely. Colin Furs, first time I've met Colin Furs, and I have to say, I do watch his YouTube channel, I do follow him. And I, what an absolute delight to talk talk to um, and uh, the mind this mind is incredible the things he comes up with um, yeah it's been such a joy to meet these so people. I heard about the tunnel the tunnel's awesome <laughs> yeah, the tunnel. 
<laughs> he wouldn't want a tunnel from the house to their office. You saw that I did pose the question about where, where do you come up with these things, and it wasn't really you know light bulb moment or anything. He wasn't really too sure to be honest. So. <laughs> and I've really enjoyed. Yeah, uh, James Holland is a great friend of the Tank Museum's Brendan Farrell. Um, he's uh, recently released a book about uh, the experience of the Sherwood Rangers Yeomanry in Northwest Europe. I think it's one of his best books he's ever written. And uh, there's some people he refers to him that have also been friends of the Tank Museum. There was a wonderful veteran that we used to deal with a lot, a guy called Ken Tout, who's also written some tremendously insightful books about the Northwest campaign. And, uh, and, and Ken died earlier this year. It was really sad. But James is one of these people who put those stories out there for the rest of the world forever. And of course, William Bannister catching up with William is always a joy. His collection, I mean, in my personal opinion, second to none. Attention to detail like nothing I've ever seen yeah, before. He's got some cracking vehicles there, and they're based here at the Tank Museum as well. So it's tremendous to be able to take those into the into the uh, into the world. Uh, and it's great to see Rob here as well from the US, uh, the American collection. Yeah, they, they try hard on the US collection. <laughs> they, I wouldn't say they're the best in the world, but they're probably trying to. They're, they're muscling in to try and be second best collection. I in the did world, actually say to Rob. Off camera, I, I hasten to add. So, Rob, when you come here, what's there? You you look at what's good, what's not so good. You just steal ideas. Yeah, of course they do. Yeah, absolutely. And we've actually we've got quite a lot of the tank museum directors from around the world come to these events where we've got a we've got a tank club called Tank Net where we all get our heads together once once a year. We swap notes and ideas. It's a great time. Is there a funny handshake involved, or? Uh, so it's more of a track rather than anything else. <laughs> it's the, uh, it's, no, it's, it's, uh, we, we work closely together. There's a lot more swaps, exchanges than loans, a lot more exchange of ideas, and it's great to be able to bring them together. It is fantastic. And I say in my role, I've been so fortunate to visit so many museums. Um, and I was amazed at how many times they talk about other museums, what's going on, like you say, the swaps there. You know, we want something, we'll reach out to so-and-so to get something else. Um, so it's, a, yeah, it's it was, a very special club, I imagine. It is, and as a group of museums, are trying to solve a lot of the same problems. So when, if you're trying to look after you know, the suspension system on a panther, there's only a select group of people in the world you can go to about, you know, how have you tried it? Uh, and whether it's about exchanging spare parts, it's when you're looking at vehicles, so a number of us have got you know, gaps in collections which the others can try and help fill. Uh, so there's a healthy exchange. One of the vehicles we saw early going around was a, a Polish T-72. We didn't have a running T-72 in our collection. We were able to exchange a Chieftain for a T-72. There's an ongoing debate about who did better out of the exchange. <laughs> uh, but in both cases, these are the sorts of things that work out. And these, these, this brings a whole... Uh, collections these go up uh, everyone improves everyone's at uh, practice improves so it's, it's, it's really good to see I have to say always a question for any director I come across Richard now your collection is vast I mean absolutely vast but I'm sure there's always something else that you want Absolutely, it's very nice. Uh, this guy we know runs a, a bicycle shop, and uh, he has a he has um, a, a sign in his shop that says uh, X equals N plus one, where X is the correct number of bicycles, and N is the number you have now. Uh, so all of us, we've always got something we want. So if I was looking at our, our wish list at the moment, I'd probably have uh, top of the wish list nowadays. It would probably be a JS three or IS three. Uh, it's a you know, really crucial linking tank of end of the Second World War, beginning of the Cold War. Fills a really important mm. gap. Uh, it would complete the set that goes to the British Conqueror and the American M103. Uh, uh, so JS, JS3 in particular, I'd put at the top of the list. Um, we used to have T3476, but we've got a wonderful one on loan from the Finnish Museum, um, uh, which is a, a terrific example of an early T3476. Um, then we're probably into some of the more modern stuff, so uh, we're really keen on a, a Merkava um, uh, from uh, the Israelis. It's a really difficult, different school of tank design uh, as we remain the British Army's kind of teaching collection, the main reference collection in the United Kingdom. That would be important. That also Merkava would be great. Uh, I was going back onto the Soviet stuff, um, T-64, um, I would put in there. So T-64, different type of tank design to what you see in T-72, more sophisticated. Uh, you can probably tell me the differences between T-64 and T-72 in terms of road wheels, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. but T-64, another sort of really key linking tank. If you want to understand T-80, you can't understand T-80 without T-64 uh, behind it, so we'd be interested in T-64. Uh, if anyone from the US military is watching, Abrams. Uh, our first request for an Abrams, 1997. Uh, that's still going through the system. 
Uh, but at what stage does the museum? Because, you know, at this stage, obviously vehicles that are still in service, I mean, there must be, I mean, security implications and all this sort of thing as well. Yeah, so the, the modern equipment is harder to get. So we can, we're, we're relatively up to date on British equipment, so we can get prototype vehicles from the British. Yeah. Um, but other countries' equipment, we have to wait for the next generation to come in before our vehicles uh, uh, can be updated. Anyway, so uh, you can hear behind me that the British Army display is, is moving into full motion. Uh, if you want to see the latest armoured vehicles, David Willey is going to be taking us through that over the next few minutes now. We're going to cut over to him. Uh, that whole idea, the old days made of wood, now plastic drain pipes, drop in the hole, that'll take the weight of a tank going over the top of it. And they're rather crude but simple way of doing things. Pick it up with your bucket and put it back on the rear of the vehicle, ready for next time. The Trojan there also has a sister vehicle then. This is the bridge layer, the Titan. So we can also bridge gaps, we can bridge rivers. So that's a great, useful tool for the British Army. We have 33 of each variant, so we can use these to get our heavy vehicles where they need to be in the battle. And I mentioned it yesterday, there's some vehicles that really look the part. Uh, the Krav, it's uh, based on originally Challenger 1 hull, wasn't it? It's got a dozer blade on the front and extra armour down the sides. You can see we've got bar armour. You'll see that on a lot of vehicles nowadays to trap rocket-propelled grenades. And also the zigzaggy bits, the boxes, that's reactive armour. What's reactive armour do? So reactive armour has explosive charge sandwiched between it. We've seen it on the video screens. So if a projectile does come and hit it, that will blow up first before the warhead gets a chance to penetrate the hull. So uh, Trojan has picked up the uh, for scenes, dropping it back on the rear of the vehicle so it can move off. Um, it started our displays with a mine plough on the front. Um, mine ploughs, again, another thing we've seen in the Ukraine really important for how you can cross a mine field you need to get those mines out of the way So as we take the recovery engineer variants off the field, um, you think they look big and impressive. You've definitely got to wait to the end of the display where we run them all around. They do a carousel together and all go around together, and that's uh, quite something to look at. Now, this is a moment back to suspension of belief. Bit of imagination, please, because we're going to show you these vehicles now, which, of course, normally may be two, three kilometres apart in our rather small arena, um, so a bit of imagination needed, but Ted's going to take us through how some of this kit would be used in an engagement. Now, we better get out of the way, because um, there's pyros, pops, bangs, smoke, so um, hopefully all your clothes will smell good by uh, the time you get home this evening with all that diesel. Diesel put onto the hot exhaust to make the screen? Yes, this is something that's been used for a while now. Get that neat diesel on a hot exhaust, creates this thick white smoke, that's great for obscuring the, uh, the signature of the tank and also stops lasers from penetrating and getting accurate ranges on the vehicle. And boy, does it make your clothes smell good as well at the end of the day. So uh, we're just going to manoeuvre a couple of vehicles out the way for you and uh, then I'm going to hand over to Ted and we'll see uh, how an engagement might take place. So we've got a five kilometre stretch of land right in front of us, somewhere foreign. And what's going to happen now, we're going to have a little battle scene for you. Hello, Juliet, 1-1 one, one Alpha, this is Zero. In map, one times BRDM, static on junction, west of your position. Move now to confirm, over. Juliet, 
One one alpha, moving now. Out. So what's happened there? We've got I star, so we've got a drone in the sky. As we have seen around today, we could use these small drones to get up high and look across the battlefield. So this drone has had a look across the battlefield and seen there's an enemy vehicle on this junction, and now it's going to get this the jackal here to investigate. So the BRDM-2 that's out there, the threat vehicle, BRDM-2, one of these 1960s went into service. These are now again being used in the Ukraine. Amphibious, uh, very effective small vehicle, thin armour, but still going strong all these years later. So that jackal then has just crested that high ground just enough so the commander can get eyes on on that vehicle. He's seen something, so he's going to deploy his crew. It looks like they're getting a javelin out the back. St. Javelin's coming out the back of there, and we're going to contact that vehicle. The infantry not being seen, being careful not to be seen, are going to crawl up onto that position and destroy that enemy vehicle. Hello, Zero, this is Juliet, 11 Alpha, one times, BRDM, engaged and destroyed on junction, I am withdrawing, out. So whenever the British Army come into contact, we're going to just change our position so that we don't get here ourselves. Doctrine from, from some enemy forces are going to be... Looks like we've also got some enemy that have moved in, into a position, pole position. They're going to hunker up there, and we'll see what happens to them next. So we've got some enemy vehicles then pushing onto the field. These guys are going to move into position. This is a classic kind of thing that will happen. They're going to move forward and get our to see if there's any more people out there that they're going to be looking for.
to the enemy vehicles are taking up position looking over this swathes of land and see if there's any more enemy out there they've already know that there's been a recce vehicle seen from us so now they're going to see what else comes out Megatron pushing forward now to get eyes on, see if there's any enemy out there. Hello Zero, this is Charlie Woman Alpha. Contact tank way out. T-72 shot. Hello Zero, in. this is Charlie Woman Alpha. Contact, add that now. One times T-72. Static in open. I have engaged and destroyed. Maintaining eyes. Out. Zero, this is Charlie Woman Alpha. Sighting enemy dismount in bunker north of Large Mound. I am observing. Out. Hello, Golf Box Shot, FIFA Alpha. This is Charlie Woman one Alpha. Fire mission over. Golf Fox Shot, 3 4 Alpha. Fire mission over. A Charlie Woman one Alpha. A uniform tango. 6 5 4 2. Neutralize for 1 minute. Over. Golf Foxtrot 34 Alpha, Uniform Tango, 6542, neutralized for one minute, out. Hello Charlie 11 one Alpha, this is Golf Foxtrot 34 Alpha, shot, out. So we've just softened up that target with some artillery. A lot's just happened. The Challenger 2 has seen the enemy. They pushed backwards, used their smoke to obscure the enemy from seeing them. The infantry now is contacting the tank, but the tank's just boun bouncing those rounds off. Hello, Whiskey 1-1 one, Bravo, this is Zero. Reference Charlie 1-1 one, one Alpha sighting. Move now to clear enemy dismounting bunker. Out. So the Challenger 2 has now called up the infantry call sign, so they're going to push forward in the Warrior and be deployed onto the target. Cover, so you're going to have to deal with this. They're deploying smoke to cover their movement. Hello, Zero, this is Whiskey Warmer Bravo. Contact TSM2 and Dismount West of Mount have deployed anti tank team to destroy tank. Deploying Dismount to clear bunker position. Out. The infantry have engaged the tank and they've destroyed that tank. As you can see, he's dropped it down because that is a one-use weapon. Now the infantry are going to move on to that target.
The infantry have just thrown a grenade in there to clear that target. Then they're going to rush in and destroy the enemy. Hello, Zero. This is Whiskey 11 Bravo. Position clear. Out. And that's the position clear. And with that, that's the end of this battle, and we have won. Well, thank you, Ted, very much for that, taking us through that, and thank you for all the guys there. And it was a good job we win. If uh, the British Army ever loses, we're not paying, OK? So um, thank you to all the guys here. Now, just to let you know what we're going to do now, um, the vehicles, we've got some vehicles to reposition, but these vehicles are then going to carousel around the arena. So there's some great photo opportunities there. And as I've said, on the first two days of Tank Fest, one thing we always make the point of, most of you here are British today, your army, these soldiers, young men, young women, they're going to go to places around the world that politicians you vote into power send them to. So please do remember that. You own them. Uh, bear that one in mind for the future. So please give them all a really good round of applause for doing what they do for us. And as they're just prepping those vehicles for a last tour around, um, don't forget, we said it earlier, the site is open till 6 o'clock. You can still see the museum. There's plenty of other bits and pieces to see um, that may help you on your journey home. Don't all leave at the same time. It might help stagger that uh, exit from the car park. We're here live at Tankfest 2023 here at the Tank Museum in Bovington in the south of England. We've just seen a fantastic display by the British Army, which is still kind of going on a bit behind us. Uh, there's a new generation of equipment here. These are incredibly imposing fighting machines, which are right at the edge of technology today. Um, hope you've been enjoying Tankfest live during the course of the day. The Challenger 2 Good old goes Megatron. within a few <laughs> feet of my back. I hope you've enjoyed Tank Fest Live through the course of the day. If you've been enjoying it, please do remember to try and support us on Patreon uh, through the various YouTube means uh, and by, of course, buying things in our shop. If you have supported already, thank you so much for your support. We really do appreciate it. We need it to keep bringing this subject alive for the future.
And of course, another way you can support the Tank Museum is to grab yourself the Tank Fest Sharp Lines camo or, of course, the Chieftain Proto. I think it's going on behind us there, Richard. It's very busy. It's, uh, it's always going on behind us, Leah. I've got to say, carry on talking on camera when you've got but 70 tonnes of steel going behind you. <laughs> so it's slightly unnerving. So one of the things we did there, Richard, was painting the, the Chieftain there. Um, as you can see, one thing that never ceases to amaze me, eight hours of video showing a Chieftain being painted. Um, yeah. It's like watching paint dry. It, 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 well, it's indeed watching paint dry. You'll be surprised how many people were watching this. Uh, the, my favourite comment that anyone made in the entire part of it, the, uh, as we, we did it in a couple of stages, and it was the second one was watching paint dry part two. <laughs> and someone put a comment on there saying, oh no, I missed part one. And so, so I said, yeah, part one was awesome. <laughs> and there is another highlight on there, if you notice, uh, I can't remember which point it was now, but there's a fly <laughs> that flies in front of the camera, which is quite interesting. It stays there for a good few minutes. That got a lot of comments during the course <laughs> of the live stream. The fly was one of the highlights. <laughs> And here we can see at the moment, they're just uh, wrapping up, getting the vehicles ready to go. Um, I think straight away there, Richard, you can see, I mean, the difference between what we've seen as far as the arena shows were concerned, there you bring on the latest equipment. Um, and of course, something which you have to appreciate is, you know, for safety reasons, they can't actually rag it around the arena. Absolutely, yeah. And these vehicles, are, they're capable of more than that. But this is, a, this is a whole world different. This is a new generation of equipment. The Chieftain was the British Army's main battle tank for over 20 years. It's the tank I started my army career on, but because we never took it into combat, and because it never matched the export success of its predecessor, the Centurion, it doesn't get the recognition it deserves. I'm going to put that right in this video. Five cool things about the Chieftain tank. The Chieftain's L11 A5 120mm rifle gun holds the world record for the longest recorded tank kill. Admittedly, this was on a Challenger 1 in 1991. However, the gun is exactly the same as this one that was developed for Chieftain. It also used two-part ammunition, which separated the propellant from the round. This reduced the size and the weight of the ammunition and did away with the inconvenience of a used shell rolling around in the turret after firing. A lot is said about the L60 Leyland engine, and not much of it complimentary. Yes, it broke down a lot, but it was ahead of its time. It was designed to be multi-fuel and run off diesel, petrol or aviation fuel. This would have been very helpful in wartime when logistics are stretched. It was also designed with the engine and cooling system in a single unit or pack which meant that if the engine failed, it could be easily disconnected, lifted out and replaced with a new one in under two hours. The Chieftain prioritised firepower and protection over mobility. So whilst it was rather heavy and a little slow, it was well protected, especially with the addition of steel brew. The armour was far thicker than any of its contemporaries or adversaries with Leopards, M60, T62 or T72 being, on paper at least, far less robust. That said, there is a serious question as to how effective the Chieftain's armour would have been if hit by a depleted uranium APFSDS round fired by a T72, reminding us that all tanks are vulnerable to enemy fire. Unlike most tanks where the driver sits in an upright position, the Chieftain driver is in a recumbent position. In other words, he's lying down. The reason for this is down to the design philosophy of the Chieftain tank, which is to make a very low profile. 
There is no doubt that the driver's seat is the best seat in the house. Well, in terms of comfort, anyway. Everyone knows the Brits love tea, including our tank designers. This is the boiling vessel. It allows the crews to boil water while shut down in the tank. It was first used in the Centurion and is still in service today in the modern Challenger 2. Whilst it is not unique to the Chieftain, I'm including it in this list because I can personally attest to its importance. The simple addition massively improves the comfort of the crew by giving us the opportunity to have hot food and a hot drink during those many tedious hours on operations. And a happy tank crew is a much bigger threat to the enemy than a cold, miserable one. Hopefully now you'll look a little differently at the Chieftain tank. A tank that is very dear to my heart, having served on them for many years. Until next time, take care. If you were captivated by the five cool things about the Chieftain tank, don't miss the chance to command one yourself in World of Tanks. Get your own Chieftain Proto and discover the thrill of commanding this revolutionary vehicle firsthand. Bar armor. It looks flimsy, it looks rather odd, and it looks like it might not do much. However, Bar armor is actually an incredibly effective way of protecting a vehicle against certain types of ammunition. Bar armor first saw use in World War II, however over the years it's become a lot more refined. Bar armor is designed to stop shape charge based ammunition, such as RPGs or heat rounds, by essentially pinching the round and crushing the switch in the nose, preventing it from detonating. This type of armor was incredibly effective in conflicts such as Afghanistan, where weapons like RPGs posed a huge threat. This type of armor is not only effective, but it's also relatively easy to produce and extremely lightweight compared to the thickness of armor you would need to stop a shape charge based round from penetrating a vehicle. And that's why today, many vehicles used by armed forces all around the world still continue to use this type of armor. This is an armor piercing, fin stabilized, discarding Sabo round, or for short, APFSDS. This round is fired from a powerful gun and will travel at well over a mile per second towards a heavily armored target, and usually that would be a tank. It's a kinetic energy penetrator, and what that essentially means is that this dart is designed to rip through armor, and often it'll come out the other side. The round itself is essentially made of two components, the first being the fin round itself, which is made of incredibly dense materials such as tungsten and even depleted uranium. The second component is the sabot that surrounds the dart. The sabot is just there to ensure that the projectile is positioned in the center of the barrel when it's fired, and upon leaving the barrel, the sabot with its high drag design is ripped from the projectile, leaving this hurtling towards its target. This round is just one of many different types of ammunition that can be used with tanks. Welcome back to Tank Fest 2023, live here at the Tank Museum. Uh, we're nearing the end of the show now, and I have to say, uh, this next bit I'm not really looking forward to. It's a bit of a tear in my eye here. Now, Mr. Smith is actually leaving as director of the Tank Museum after an incredible 17 years in the director's spot. It sounds like a long time when you <laughs> set out live like that. Richard, how have you found your time here? Uh, it's been fantastic. This is, a, this is one of those sort of jobs where I always describe it as the kind of job that gives you a lingering feeling of getting away with something. <laughs> it's, I, have, I have loved it. We've, uh, there's been a great team here. And uh, it's running a museum is a team sport. It's that uh, you don't do this on your own. The, t the team's been fantastic over a really long time, and you know together we've we've built this thing up into something new. And it's with World of Tanks uh, and yourself been a huge part of it as well, and taking us to audiences we'd have never reached. It's been it's been an honour and a privilege uh, to have run the Tank Museum for 17 years, and uh, it's going to be uh, it's going to be hard moving on. But it's it's the right time for me to move on. It's the and it's the right time for someone else to come in. Oh bless you and. As a gesture of our thanks for World of Tanks, just from a very personal standpoint, Richard, can I say it's been an absolute honour. You know, you've become a friend over the years. Uh, and for everything you've done for us, everything you've done for the audience, and obviously the wider community, um, and we so wish you the best of luck. Um, as a little token of our appreciation, we have for you here a little something. I need to do a balancing <laughs> act here. Um, 
we'd like to present you with this. Now, this is Ooh. incredibly special. This is a key to World of Tanks. So this would give you <laughs> a lifetime premium account. We didn't want you to miss out on any of your vehicles that you've got down here. <laughs> so you can keep your hand in, in the tank world. And also, it unlocks every single premium tank that you get in World of Tanks. I, I'm sure Mrs. Smith will be delighted. <laughs> because that's fantastic. I think that's fantastic. I, I do play the game, and it's, it's always great. So many of the vehicles are based off what we've got. Thank you. It's been a pleasure working with you and the team, and I, but I will be following your progress in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you, Richard. Now, we do have another special guest uh, joining us today. I'm delighted to introduce uh, Lieutenant Colonel Simon Worth. Now, Simon is the commanding officer of the Royal Tank Regiment, and, uh, and Richard was... 30 years in the Royal Tank Regiment, his previous life. And Simon isn't just here to come and look at the show. Simon is here uh, to make a presentation. Uh, so I'm going to hijack the live stream for a little bit, which is kind I of... I said we're totally yeah, off script here. I'm really yeah, we're, worried. We're, 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 no we <laughs> we're going to go a cappella for a bit. And I think, you know, firstly, um, how wonderful it is to be on such an important day for tanks globally, to be streamed and to celebrating all things tank. But what I'm really here to do today is to celebrate you. So... Um, I am going to give you, on behalf of the Colonel Commandant RTR, uh, Brigadier Gavin Thompson, uh, a Colonel Commandant's Commendation for Meritorious Service. Uh, it's, it's only the second to be given out, so it's, it's, a, it's a pretty big thing. Um, and it recognises how much you've done um, for the museum, for the regiment, and to build the connections between World of Tanks, the gaming community, and the tank world. Uh, and to take our whole thing forward and to, you know, and to tell everybody across the world the thing that we do and help them celebrate it and enjoy it a bit too through the game. So I'm really, really honoured to be here today to present this to you. Congratulations and, and thank you from everyone in the museum, in the regiment and in the world, in the, in the global armoured community. Oh my goodness. Well, thank you very much, Colonel. Thank you. I'm absolutely honoured. <laughs> well, that's uh, <laughs> taking me by surprise. Um, and all that's left to do, Richard, I think, is... Um, yeah, and that's, uh, I think that on, that, on that note, I think that draws our live stream to an end. It's been a fantastic day, Simon. Thank you for coming. Uh, Richard, it's been a, always a joy, and I've loved working with you over many, many years now. It's a tremendous that you've had this honour from you very your much. own Just regiment. Blown away. <laughs> and, it's, uh, and it's been great here at Tankfest 2023. This is the end of the show today. It's been a fantastic weekend. I hope you've enjoyed it online as well. And it's goodbye from me, Richard Smith, the director of the Tank Museum. And again, thank you all for watching. Thank you for your support. And um, until next time, take care.